Um, if I could ask everyone to please recite the Pledge of Allegiance. And Kelly's got the flag somewhere. Yeah, there we go. nice. There we go. All right. You start us, Pat. <laughs> okay, I pledge allegiance, I pledge allegiance to, the flag to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, of America and, and to the republic, republic for which it stands, stands one, nation, one nation, under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with, with liberty, liberty and justice, justice, justice for, all. for all. Okay, roll call, please, Kel. Jim Batson. Here. Don Carmichael. Here. Pat Grudy. Here. Lisa Hessel. Here. Kevin Huber. Here. Karen Lundstedt. Here. Casey Rooney. Here. Okay, so we note all board members are present. Um, our agenda this evening, we will first open it up for public comment. Um, we did solicit for public comment and we will read into the record uh, those which we have received. Um, then we are gonna spend the bulk of our time tonight on discussing, discussions relating to the various school opening scenarios. Um, I know everybody's aware of what those scenarios are, um, but the real purpose of tonight is to get everyone clear on you know, all of the various details of those scenarios um, and, uh, you know, the various challenges and implications associated with each one of those. Um, I, I will say before I start that discussion, um, I know I have received some feedback about our virtual meetings. Um, and I know there are some in the community that are, are starting to question uh, as we begin to talk about opening schools, um, you know, basically when are we gonna start to meet again publicly? Uh, so we have thought about that and we would like to meet publicly, um, but as you know, per state order, we're still limited to having no more than 50 people in any one place. Uh, and as you can see from the participants tonight, we're already up to 118. So if we were meeting virtually tonight, we would have to basically not include um, upwards of 60 people in our, in our discussions this evening. So uh, among other reasons, one of the main reasons we want to continue to meet virtually as long as it's allowed by the governor is um, it does allow us to actually reach a broader audience than we could do in person. All right, so I just wanted to make sure everybody understands that. We will certainly resume uh, in-person meetings as soon as it's practical. All right, so again, we want to spend the bulk of the time talking about the different scenarios. Um, this is your time uh, to really ask questions and really get clarity on, on any and all things that you're concerned about or interested in on, on all these different scenarios. Uh, we are not taking any action tonight, all right? So we're not gonna vote on any particular scenario. Um, however, uh, the school year is coming upon us quickly. Uh, and I think it would be a good idea for us at least to have an informal poll of the board members with respect to which way each of us is leaning um, in terms of the various options under consideration, okay? So I am gonna kind of challenge us a little bit tonight to kind of weigh in on where you stand. Understanding that's not a vote, it's not a, it's not a, a final position, um, but in essence, I'd like to understand if, if you were to have to vote tonight, which way are you leaning? Because I think it's real important that we give the administration some pretty clear direction um, with the amount of time available and left to us, it's just not practical to fully parallel path all of the different options that continue to be in play here. So I, I wanna try to kind of narrow the focus of the team a little bit and, and uh, you know, see where the board members are, okay? Um, before I open up for any questions though, uh, then we will convene an executive session. So what that means, especially for those of you from the public that are on tonight, uh, we will have to log off of this particular Zoom call and then reconvene a second one. Uh, and we will meet briefly to discuss collective negotiating matters. After that executive session is complete, we will come back to this public link and close out the meeting. Uh, we will not be taking any action after that executive session, um, but anybody that wants to is certainly free to come back and, and uh, rejoin the session, okay? Um, and that's it. Are there any questions about the agenda before we start? Pat, do you want to read the citation we're meeting under in closed session? Uh, I can do that. Yes. Um, okay. So it's collective negotiating matters, um, 5 ILCS 120 slash 2C2. 
Okay. All right. Thank you for that. Any other questions before we start? Okay. I will turn it over then to Dr. Lee and his team uh, to carry it forward from here. Yeah, thank you. Good to see the board and uh, thanks to everyone who's uh, joined uh, the uh, meeting tonight. Uh, we're going to start with uh, public comment under the virtual model. Uh, we read these comments into the record versus somebody being at the board meeting uh, and actually reading uh, these uh, themselves. Uh, I am reading them in the order that we received them um, for this meeting. Uh, this is from uh, Eileen Baranek. Um, <clears throat> As a teacher who has been in the district since 2001, I have never faced an opening day with such fear and trepidation. My husband has survived cancer twice and had a major heart attack before the age of 40. He has permanent damage to his heart. I'm terrified that by teaching in-person classes, I will be exposed to COVID and wind up killing my husband. Not working isn't an option for me or my family. High school students are nearly full grown and are not like the small children who are perhaps less adequate as vectors for this virus. Our ventilation system is not hospital grade. And if we teach in person, we will be in a closed environment, breathing each other's air all day long, even with masks on. While teaching remotely is not ideal, as another teacher on Twitter wrote, I would rather lose a semester with my students than the life of a single student or colleague. I do not believe uh, there is any in-person scenario that can keep us safe. If my husband dies, will you explain to my heartbroken five-year-old why an in-person scenario was more important than her father's life? If I die, will you pick up the pieces of my shattered family? When my students die, will this have been worth it? What promise can the district make to me that my family, my students, and their families will be safe? What will the district provide to ensure this? Thank you, Eileen. Uh, second comment is from Ross Caton. Um, hello, my name is Ross Caton. I've been a teacher at Vernon Hills High School for the past 17 years, as well as my wife, Denise Caton, for 15 years. We live in Libertyville and we have two boys who attend Hawthorne Elementary North. We are proud members of this community and are very interested in the success of D128. I would like nothing more for my children and my wife and I to return to school this fall. However, the reality of COVID-19 has affected my family directly. My father, Douglas Caton, was a resident at a nursing home in Kenosha, Wisconsin. He passed away on June 9th at the age of 73. This was about three weeks after the Wisconsin State Supreme Court struck down the state's stay-at-home order. If you remember the scenes of people flocking to bars and restaurants. In the weeks following, Wisconsin saw their COVID infections rise as people began to share indoor spaces. Unfortunately, I was unable to see my father for months before his death. And by the time I had been notified he was sick and had gone to the hospital, he had already been placed on a ventilator. Five hours later, he was dead. No family was able to say goodbye or be with him when he passed. Despite nurses fearing he had COVID, his test came back negative. Though staff still marked his body as being COVID positive because the test is not 100% accurate. I share this story with you for those who have not experienced to some degree or another, the reality of this pandemic, especially for those like me who have family, family members, my wife, VHHS teacher, Denise Caton included, with weakened immune systems. I am very scared to return to school, even in a limited capacity. As a teacher and a parent, I know the importance of children being in school for their academic and social development. Unfortunately, I have seen in our community too many people not following state guidelines for helping to reduce the spread of COVID. As we saw last week with a student in a VHHS athletic camp, COVID is in our community. I know that this is not an easy decision to make. I myself have been going back and forth on this question. Though please keep in mind, while Illinois has a lower infection rate compared to most other states, our rate is currently increasing. Our rate is higher today than on March 13th when we close the school buildings. I know e-learning is not the best option academically for our students. However, it is best for their health and resilience as well as members of our community. I know D128 has provided the best tools and teachers for getting the most out of e-learning for our students. That is why Denise and I chose this community and we hope for our family to survive this 
and be able to see our sons walking the halls of VHHS or LHS in the future. Thank you. Uh, the next message is from Julie Wagner. If you don't feel safe conducting this meeting in person, how can you possibly justify putting hundreds of students and adults in a building together each day in just a few weeks? You had the opportunity to conduct this meeting with the same safety precautions that are being recommended for in-person learning. Why continue to conduct business virtually? Because you know it's, a, it's the safer option and you know the risk of community spread is not worth it. You shouldn't put students, teachers, and their families at risk, especially when you aren't willing to take that risk yourself. Do not allow for in-person learning until there is a vaccine. If you do, you are responsible for the illness that spreads. You are responsible for any long-term health conditions that students, teachers, or communities develop. And God forbid, you are responsible for any deaths in the community and the immense grief that will follow. Next uh, message is from Pete M. Understanding the available options for school returns, I'm concerned there's no viable option other than remote learning. Given the escalation of cases and deaths resulting from the reopening of public venues, which has included infections of student athletes at VHHS during summer programs, how does the school expect to avoid contamination with either a hybrid or full reopening? My question is based on the following. A hybrid option requires students to return on an intermittent basis. Theoretically, this option is viable, but the application is simply not, is not simply because all students, regardless of how infrequently they physically attend school, will still have exposure to the same teachers. What's to happen if a teacher becomes sick, let alone any students? Obviously, full reopening doesn't seem advantageous at this juncture either. The only possible reason either a hybrid or full opening, reopening seems possible, is if a medical breakthrough occurs ending this disease. Uh, next message is from Matt Clifford. Uh, my name is Matt Clifford. I have been a social studies teacher at Vernon Hills High School for 12 years and a community member of District 12849. I currently reside in Libertyville with my family and my children are students at Hawthorne Elementary North. I'm writing I'm writing to you knowing that you are facing difficult decisions in an unprecedented time. I have nothing but the utmost respect for the work and vision of the school board and administration of Community High School District 128, and I'm proud to serve our students. With that said, I would like to express my apprehensions and fears in regards to any return to in-person schooling in the fall. To be clear, I believe that e-learning is not as effective as in-person schooling. However, in the face of the current pandemic, which is only increasing in severity in the United States and the state of Illinois, I fear placing myself, my colleagues, my students, and my family at risk. An unfortunate decision you will have to make for others. I simply ask, as I'm sure you are, to consider not opening schools to in-person learning in the fall. I believe the health and wellness of all stakeholders lay in balance. And although learning will not be as effective, we must put our lives first. Our community, our state, and our country simply are not in a place where they can ensure a safe place for students and staff. Thank you for your time and all the difficult work that you have been engaging in during these difficult months. Next letter is from uh, Stephanie Mustari. Respectfully, I do not understand why teachers and students are being called back to in-person school. The COVID-19 pandemic across the U.S. has gotten worse, and this summer in Illinois, our progress has started to go backwards. I understand that remote learning is not ideal by any means, but in a matter of life and death, in my opinion, there is no other choice here. An example of how schools are attempting BTS more productively, uh, the two largest school districts in California, Los Angeles and San Diego, have announced all classes will be online in the fall, in an effort to protect students and staff against COVID-19. I think the safest and, regretful, and regretfully only option is to require uh, school to be uh, entirely remote until further notice. Thank you. The next message is from Lisa J. I hope everyone is healthy and doing well. I know the past four months have been challenging, figuring out what our school days will look like for the 2020-2021 school year. I thank you for all your time and effort. 
I would also like to thank the committees for their input and time as well. One understands that present circumstances create a more challenging environment for teachers, just as many community members face significant challenges also. So many families in our communities have lost jobs with little opportunity to find new, uh, while others face extended pay cuts and neither may recover the loss. There is significant hardship. Given the hardship, it was disconcerting to see mention of collective bargaining and recent communication to parents. One would hope unions will not request salary increases under the present conditions. If it is determined additional compensation is warranted under COVID-19, that said increase would be limited to this school year. In addition, I hope we are able to keep all extracurricular activities. This is so important for the emotional and physical well-being of our, of our students. If we are not able to move forward with extracurricular activities, it would be fiscally responsible to stop the payment of stipends. I thank you for your time and for serving the community and keeping our children's needs as a top priority. Uh, the next message is from Robert Wilson. I hope this finds you well. I'm writing to share a comment regarding classes in August for the invitation for public comment during Monday's committee the whole meeting. I imagine it must be a daunting task to go through all of them. Thank you for helping in the effort to determine what is safest for D128 students and staff. My comment begins on the line below and continues through the end of this message. As a D12 educator of D128 educator of 17 years, I am dedicated to supporting my students' academic and social emotional growth, and I fully understand the importance of being in the classroom with students. However, given the reports of COVID-19 cases and the data we currently have, I am confident in my assertion that we do not yet have the virus under sufficient control in order to benefit from any form of in-person classes in August. Even though we would attempt to mitigate the health risks of an August return with safety measures, such as social distancing and PPE, the experience we could offer to students would in no way resemble what they were accustomed to prior to March. We will not be able to break social distancing to engage in normal interpersonal interactions. We will struggle against the discomfort of wearing face masks consistently and properly. We will have to endure the emotional stress of isolating from family members who are elderly or immunocompromised. We will have to watch as friends, family, students, and teachers suffer the recovery period and unknown long-term effects of the virus. Students and staff with anxiety will undoubtedly experience a heightened sense of panic and distraction from the tasks they are expected to accomplish. When the first case in our building is, real, is reported, we will feel all the more anxious and distracted from our work. When the first death in our building occurs, what then? Um, will it be then that we retreat to the e-school plan that currently lies before us as the safest and best option to begin the 2020-2021 school year? I certainly agree that we must return to the classroom, but not before it is sufficiently safe to do so. Any intended benefits of the in-person experience that we can offer students will be negated by the overwhelming circumstances under which we will be required to operate. I am incredibly uneasy about returning to the classroom while the virus continues to surge and people de debate the efficacy of the recommended safety measures. Both students and staff will find it difficult or even impossible to perform to the best of their abilities under these conditions. As an experienced educator, I can tell you that the benefits of returning to in-person classes at this time do not outweigh the risk of contracting the virus or spreading it to others. As such, I recommend eSchool as the safest and best option to resume education until the virus is sufficiently controlled with a vaccine or effective treatment of symptoms. Uh, the next message is from Mike Belmont. Um, I am writing to you in regard to the open comment questioning for this evening's District 128 Board of Education meeting. Comment, given the current situation in our district and surrounding areas, it's difficult to feel safe bringing back in-person learning. The CDC warns that fully opening schools in the fall would create the highest risk of spreading the coronavirus. Questions, according to the CDC, 40% of infected people are asymptomatic. How will the self-assessment be effective? 
if in-person learning is recommended, do families have the option to do remote learning instead? Uh, the next message is from David Recker. It has been four weeks since I last wrote to the uh, BOE to understand what plans were being considered for the upcoming 2020-2021 school year, and we have still not heard what, if any, progress has been made with respect to those plans. We were told that the plans for reopening are in the hands of various task forces, and the operations of those task forces were not public. It is now one month until the beginning of the school year, and there is no specific information on what plans are being considered. I asked in my last communication that these task forces be open to the public so that the public can understand what deliberations are being undertaken and are entitled to as taxpayers, and most importantly, so that the public can provide help if so needed. For example, at the most recent BOE meeting, you received communications from multiple healthcare providers, myself included, all of whom offered their assistance in this time of crisis. To my knowledge, not a single one was contacted. The wealth of healthcare knowledge in this community is amazing. To not take advantage of the experience and knowledge of these clinicians and developing safety protocols seems very short-sighted. From where is clinical input for any proposed plan being obtained? Why are these discussions not open to the taxpaying public? This is particularly frustrating when one considers what other school districts have been doing and where they are with respect to planning compared to District 128. Just last week, the Archdiocese of Chicago announced their plans for opening. Their plans might not be perfect, but at least they, like many other school districts, have a plan and have provided parents with some degree of detail. District 128, on the other hand, is still delivering deliberating and have not made public any discussions, much less any actual plans. As I concluded in my last communication, I have heard many times that D128 is addressing the challenges of reopening and teaching in the upcoming school year no differently than other neighboring school districts. That is clearly not the case. Moreover, as I mentioned in my communication, D128 should not be following. They should be proactive in leading the plan for reopening. Our students should learn from this difficult and challenging time that those who take control of their environment will be the most likely to succeed in whatever endeavor they pursue. Now is the time to lead, not follow, not to follow. I thank you for your time and consideration. And uh, the last uh, message for this night, uh, for this evening, um, uh, is from uh, a number of teachers. Um, as uh, 2021, 2020-21, uh, the school year is about to shift out of the hypothetical and into the reality. We know that staff, administration, students, and family alike are experiencing uncertainties and anxieties related to going back to school this year, whether we are, are in a remote, standard, or hybrid situation. We know that many of the uncertainties and anxieties are shared and that there are also particular concerns held by particular groups. One such group, a large group, is working parents whose own children require full-time care. We are proud to work in a district that considers the voice of its staff, and we are grateful for ways that this particular group has already been heard, from staff surveys to the presence of working parents on the school reopening task force. As the district and union shift into the negotiation phase of the school reopening guidelines, we would like assurance that working parents have been listened to. First and foremost, we'd like to express our concern for the health and safety of ourselves, our students, and our children at home. While these populations are not considered high risk, the potential for serious illness, long-term complications, and even death is a very real possibility for each of these groups. And at this point, very little is known about these long-term serious risks. While we are all eager to be back in school and resume teaching the way we love, we implore you to prioritize the health and safety in all decision making. As such, we are stating that e-learning is a school opening method that we are most comfortable with. We know that there is a population of students who need to be on campus for a variety of reasons. One solution would be to offer on-campus e-learning for that population, supervised by staff who volunteer to work on campus with hazard pay. Further, during negotiations, we ask that the district always take into consideration the needs of working parents if and when our children's daycares tempo temporarily close. Our babysitters get sick. We lose our before after school childcare arrangements. Our children get sick with COVID-19 and need to stay home. Our children get exposed to COVID-19 and need to self-quarantine. 
and or our children's schools shift to a hybrid schedule, leaving staff members of District 128 to care for our children for unknown lengths of time. We ask that the district provide emergency medical leave for any such circumstances, rather than asking staff to use their own sick days. Working parents in this district who have used numerous sick days to take parental leaves have a limited bank to work with and will be especially burdened if self-quarantining from exposure to COVID-19 from our students, colleagues, partners, or our own children is deducted from our sick days. This would be an exceptional burden on mothers who have taken their uh, federally allocated 12 weeks of FMLA and many of the undersigned teachers who have taken parental leaves during their careers in District 128. We ask that the district always take into consideration the needs of working parents if and when our own children are in remote learning at the same time as our students are in remote working environments, leaving us in home situations where we are simultaneously, simultaneously teaching our students, teaching our own children, and taking care of our own children. We ask for flexibility and grace in these matters. Finally, we ask that the district always take into consideration that in this year of uncertainty, circumstances we have not envisioned or planned for will arise and new solutions outside of the guidelines might need to be enacted. We thank you for your consideration and support. Uh, this letter was submitted by Amy Christian. Uh, it is signed by a number of people and they requested that we read the names into the record. So I will do that at this time. Amy Christian, Ellen Macias, Siobhan Zabo, Eileen Veranek, Samantha Phillips, Amanda Patrick, Sarah Greenswag, Shona Moeller, Emily Eichmeyer, uh, Ross Caton, Tara Young, Denise Caton, Laura Oliver, Matthew Clifford, Joey Reagan, Riaz Hovedi, Shannon Garcia, Ann Singleton, Stephanie Freichels, Jessica Chapman, Amanda Carroll, Christopher Thomas, Sarah Staub, Ryan Evelyn, Steve Zabo, Allison Farrell, Alice Leafblad, Jeffrey Brown, Aaron Brown, Casey Aubin, Melissa, Melissa Aubin, Liz Peterson, Allison Reifenberg, Carrie Kesky, uh, Katie Bashar, Alex Joe, Angela Naylor, Mary Kate Chainbeck, Aaron Jaffe, Amy Wiggins, and Matt Wiggins. So that concludes the public comment, Pat. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so uh, let's move the discussions on to the various opening scenarios. Okay, Bryant is uh, gonna share some uh, slides with the board and the public. And when we get the slides up, then um, I'll uh, have commentary. And uh, members of the administration team will um, uh, be taking point at different times during the presentation and uh, contributing uh, moving forward. So um, as the board will recall, uh, back in July, uh, we created a framework uh, to begin to look at uh, the options while we were waiting for guidance from the state. And we called that transitioning to the 2020-2021 school year. There are two new words that have been um, added to all of our vocabulary, uh, whether uh, we're at home uh, or we're at work and certainly at schools and they are adaptable uh, and flexible. One thing we know moving forward However, we start school this year, there's a high likelihood that during the school year, uh, we are going to have to adapt and be flexible in a number of ways, including uh, the possibility of adopting um, different uh, methods of uh, continuing education, uh, depending on uh, health circumstances as, as they're uh, dictated. So um, that uh, is gonna be a necessary for all of us to do, uh, including uh, those of us in the school community. So important background to consider. Um, we just wanna uh, do a quick review of some of these things. The decision to allow the reopening of schools um, for any form of in-person learning will ultimately be made by the governor and specific parameters and conditions for reopening schools will be dictated by ISBE and IDPH. The decisions will not be uh, made by local school boards and whether we have an option uh, to bring students back. Um, so um, in recent weeks, uh, ISBE and the IDPH uh, have given um, uh, local school boards and local school communities uh, flexibility 
uh, in terms of bringing um, students back under several scenarios, which we'll uh, review in a few minutes. Uh, due to potential changes to contractual working conditions, any identified reopening scenarios subject to collective bargaining with the unions. And so the public understands uh, if the board uh, makes a specific school opening decision, there's an impact of that decision. The impact of that decision, if it's different from the union's current contract, requires a school board or an employer to bargain the impact of that decision. Um, and I'll um, have some more comments about um, you know, that process later. Um, next, uh, District 128, Oak Grove District 68, Libertyville District 70, Rondout District 72, and Hawthorne District 73, which are our four main feeder districts, are all actively planning for and working on reopening options that best meet their student needs. And the related superintendents are in communication with each other. Um, and that continues to be true. So uh, those four school districts are going through a very similar process uh, to evaluate um, many of the th um, things that we are evaluating in terms of making a decision that's best for their district. Other area high school districts are all actively planning for and working on reopening options that best meet the needs of their students and the related superintendents are in communication with each other. And we continue uh, to touch base with uh, our colleagues, even though we all represent individual school districts that uh, potentially have uh, individual needs and uh, local school boards may make uh, uh, different decisions in each one of those communities. Uh, we are certainly sharing uh, that moving forward. Uh, next slide. So the Restore Illinois uh, phase four plan uh, moving forward. Uh, this is just kind of the, the visualization of that. Brian, I think you can move to um, uh, slide five for us. So in the Restore Illinois plan, schools and districts are encouraged to transition to in-person instruction as regions transition to phase four. Uh, the governor, uh, of course, um, put us in phase four. The following IDPH requirements must be met. Okay, um, we must, um, we are required to use uh, use of appropriate uh, PPE, including face coverings, um, prohibit more than 50 individuals from gathering in one space, require, uh, social dis require social distancing must be observed as much as possible, uh, conduct symptom screenings and temperature checks, or require self-certification that individuals entering school buildings are symptom-free, and finally, that should be number four, increase school-wide cleaning and disinfection. So there's been some written in the media about that um, following and uh, we shared Restore um, Illinois uh, plan uh, with all of our community members. We have also uh, shared the part three guidance that we received for schools. Uh, Bryant, I think we can go to six. So uh, as we started this process, uh, again, uh, we thought it was important that um, we uh, develop some decision-making philosophy um, so uh, we developed four um, bullet pointed statements, if you will. Decision making will best ensure student, staff, and visitor safety, health, and well being, knowing that any of our plans will likely be disrupted or revised as new information emerges. Decision making will best follow CDC, Governor, ISBE, and IDPH opening options and related parameters and conditions. Decision making application and implementation will best support daring mission statement and decision-making will best incorporate adaptability and flexibility to meet changing needs and requirements. So the planning structure that we've been using in the district, just as a quick review, uh, the, we have a core planning group, which is responsible for coordination and facilitation of the overall planning work. Uh, that is made up of a group of district and uh, building uh, leaders, administrators. And then we have a task force a larger task force, which is around 50 people, which is actually the working to work group, planning to work group, uh, and then working to work group. So that consists of administrators, staff, parents, and students. And um, operating under the auspices of the task force group are eight um, working task force groups in teaching and learning, scheduling, health and safety, extracurricular activities, rentals and community education, human resources, distance learning, communication, and special services, specifically 
uh, specific logistics for individualized needs. So Brian, I think we can go on to eight here. Okay, uh, just to review the three um, potential reopening scenarios. Number one is adapted in-person opening, uh, better otherwise called a normal opening with adaptations, uh, which is a back to normal opening with physical adaptations such as temperature checks, masks, social distancing, et cetera. Two is a hybrid blended uh, opening, which in essential, uh, essentially um, uh, delimits the number of students that are in the building on any given day. Uh, teaching and learning adaptations combined with physical adaptations uh, noted above. Uh, we're going to spend more time talking um, about the task force work on the hybrid blended option. And third is enhanced remote opening um, and the enhanced version of that in our district is called eSchool. Brian, you can go to the next slide. Um, as everyone will remember in the school community, our students, our parents, and our staff, about uh, two or three weeks ago, um, we thought it was necessary to get an initial sense of preference. Um, and at that time, that was to serve as just a kind of where might we be at that point on the three openings. Um, that um, particular survey uh, was done with very limited information. Um, we did provide um, an example of a, a hybrid or blended schedule. Uh, we did not uh, provide at that time because that work was still in process uh, what um, an enhanced remote learning experience might look like. So uh, arguably in by design uh, at that time, uh, there was fairly limited information to go with choice selection. But we wanted to share um, that feedback back with the board and of course with uh, the public. So um, starting at the top, and we'll just go from parents and guardians to students and staff, uh, the blue part of the pie charts is a normal opening with adaptations. The orange part is a hybrid uh, blended schedule. Um, and uh, noted under there, um, alternating in-person and enhanced remote learning. Um, E-school split student body in half allows for more possible social distancing. See example provided in the cover message that came with that. And uh, the yellowish um, dot uh, in the area of the pie charts is enhanced remote learning, uh, or again, uh, straight D128 E school. So um, in that initial sense of preference survey, uh, a couple of three weeks ago, 57.3% uh, of parent guardians um, were um, um, selected a normal opening with adaptations. 33.3% uh, selected hybrid and 9.4% selected enhanced remote learning. In the students, 58.6% uh, uh, selected normal opening with adaptations, 29.8 hybrid or blended and 11.5% with enhanced remote learning. And staff was 44.6% um, with hybrid, 33.2% with a normal opening with adaptations and 22.3% with remote learning. And again, just the caveat for any of the selections, somewhat lim limited information, particularly uh, regarding um, um, enhanced remote learning. So, but we thank everyone. We had a great um, survey turnout uh, across all three of those groups and we really appreciate uh, people um, sharing that initial preference with us, um, you know, just very helpful. Okay, next slide. Okay, so what we want to do, uh, spend the uh, bulk of our time on this evening, is uh, we want to provide an overview of the task force uh, working groups uh, as it relates to uh, opens, uh, of the opening scenarios. Um, all of these um, groups have some relation to um, all or some of uh, the opening scenarios. So as we cross this work tonight, uh, we're gonna get in greater depth um, into sharing information regarding the hybrid or blended schedule, um, the enhanced remote learning piece of that um, schedule um, in some much greater detail. And so um, as we go through this, that provides some of the detail and background regarding 
um, you know, the opening um, scenarios moving forward. So uh, we'll hear from uh, teaching and learning, uh, athletics and extracurriculars, health and safety, uh, distance learning, and uh, human resource uh, component of this moving forward as it crosses um, the opening scenarios. Uh, Brian, can you go to the next slide? Okay, before we dive in, um, I, I want to make a couple comments on, on behalf of all of us in the school district. And that is, um, we love the students here. And the parents who trust us and send their kids to us, we love them. And that's what keeps um, our support staff, our teachers, and our uh, administrators uh, going is their opportunity to work directly with students. Um, that's essential to what we all do. Uh, you can't be a great educator without being mission driven. And that's at the core of our mission is a passion um, you know, for our students um, moving forward. I also want to let, um, as the board already knows, but I also want to let the community know that um, you know, we also care deeply for our staff because we are only as good as the people that we put in front of our kids. We've spent a lot of time here um, over the last 15 years of really putting a priority at, at bringing people into the district who believe the things that we thought were important um, and um, uh, could articulate uh, that to a level that um, ultimately uh, resulted in our kids uh, being healthy, but being more successful over time in a way that we can measure that. So we all care for our kids. And the community also needs to know that all the board members have either um, had kids in our schools or currently have uh, kids in our schools. Our administra uh, great majority of our administrative team uh, have had their own kids go through school or they're working their way through the system, uh, including my own two daughters who graduated in 2016 and 2018. So this is one area that we can certainly, uh, you know, we can certainly put our feet in the shoes of parents uh, because we've all had uh, kids uh, or we have kids that are going through high school right now. And so we can certainly project and think about uh, all the implications of the decisions we're going to make. And we want the community to know that we take those um, decisions uh, very seriously in looking at all of um, the individual components that would go into that decision making. I think as everyone can understand, uh, there'll never be a more complex, uh, significant set of decisions that school boards will make uh, than they're going to make in the next few weeks across the state of Illinois and across our country. So we just want you to know that we care about your kids, care about the people that work here, uh, and the board and the administration are committed to doing everything we can to weigh out every factor we can uh, in making a final recommendation for how we bring kids back to school in the fall, understanding that there is a high likelihood that during the school year that we're gonna transition to two of the three or all three of the three options, depending on how things happen. So, um, okay, so uh, as we move forward, normal with adaptations and hybrid blended. So there are a few things, uh, as you might imagine, uh, those of you that have uh, had kids in school, gone through an opening of school with us, uh, and certainly internally in the district, um, we've gone through that process many times. We know how to open school. But there are some unique challenges under a normal environment, and many of those challenges also um, cross over hybrid um, or blended. So some of our needs and challenges with uh, normal with adaptations, bringing kids back and hybrid, even bringing kids back, um, um, you know, not as many days as uh, in a week and mixing that with an enhanced learning. Um, some of those needs and challenges are we're still waiting uh, as all Lake County school districts are for further um, guidance from the Lake County Health Department. Some counties have gotten additional guidance. We know from working with uh, Lake County Health Department that that's uh, forthcoming. And that will be very helpful for us, uh, you know, at a local level. Um, in uh, on lots of levels. Um, one of our biggest challenges and biggest concerns in bringing students back normally or in a hybrid situation is our ability to social distance. 
So we have all been, uh, over the last uh, four months in the state, uh, IDPH has taught us that social distancing is t six to 10 feet apart for uh, you know, um, uh, less than 15 minutes, um, not to break that barrier less, uh, more than 15 minutes, and it's wearing masks. And they've done a very good job of teaching us. So as the part three guidance came out from the state, one of the things that's different about that guidance is social distancing. So instead of saying uh, needs to be six to 10 feet all the time, uh, don't break those boundaries for more than 15 minutes uh, and wear your mask, uh, the new definition of social distancing in the guidance that we received is social distance if and when possible uh, and wear a mask uh, all the time. And um, that is um, causing a lot of consideration, not only in District 128, uh, but across the state regarding that revised uh, social distancing. So, um, you know, we've spent a lot of time working on that social distancing, the original social distancing definition. Um, we've spent uh, a lot of time thinking about how to make that work. Um, and when the part three guidance came out, um, it was definitely different. And in sharing that document, anybody that looks at that document as we've shared it with the board and the community and our staff, and our students here, there are various places within that document where it moves back and forth between the newer version of um, the definition, social distance when, if and when you can, uh, and wear a mask, and the previous definition, which was six to 10 feet. And it is, um, um, it causes some folks reading that document a concern because it's not uh, more explicitly nailed down. So for example, in many places of the document, it uh, does mention social distance when possible and wear masks. If you go through the document, toward the end of the document, there's a diagram of a classroom which shows chairs that are six feet apart, which would be the old definition of uh, social distancing. So we've asked um, ISB and IDPH if they would provide uh, school districts uh, more clarity in terms of uh, their definition. Uh, we continue to get updated FAQ. Um, and then the most recent FAQ, it, it clearly says social distance when you can, wear your mask. Uh, we understand in a classroom, desk you know, may not be able to be six feet apart, depending on the option that you've chosen. So we've spent a lot of time talking about social distancing in cafeterias. Uh, in hallways, uh, and of course in classrooms. And, and working backward on that list, in classrooms we know that the state will allow um, um, classes to be configured um, with numbers that would rise above a six to 10 feet uh, social distancing distance uh, with desks in the classroom. Uh, in hallways, we've talked about ways that we can, one-way hallways that we can uh, control the flow of traffic in hallways uh, toward that. And in both of these um, uh, examples, normal with adaptations and hybrid, one of the great challenges in the, is in the cafeteria and feeding people. One of the things that um, ISB and IDPH have staked out is no more than uh, 50 people in one space. And in a school, uh, the whole school is not in one space but it is not clear uh, what our options are in uh, cafeteria or to use a larger space to help feed students. As you might imagine, if we brought 2000 students in the building at Libertyville and we go through the lunch periods they have, uh, we're going to have significantly more than 50 students in the cafeteria. So uh, that concerns us on two levels. Uh, one level is that um, there is a very limited chance to social distance at all uh, in a cafeteria uh, situation uh, such as that. Uh, so that's one concern. And the second concern is that we seemingly don't have great ability to use some of our uh, potentially other large facilities uh, to be able to uh, possibly feed students. Uh, and we all are all, and we are looking at alternative possibilities like large tenting uh, that could be set up outside of the building, 
uh, we're looking at those kind of options. But our ability to social distance, um, particularly in a cafeteria, is very, very challenging, uh, if not impossible, under the current circumstances in a situation where we would do a normal return to school. So one of the things that we've tasked Tom and J Tom Calentis and John Gilliam with is taking a look at their buildings as they exist right now, knowing that we're looking we're uh, looking at additional options to be able to do that. For example, larger facilities within the building, a field house, uh, the new dance facility at Libertyville High School and the square footage there, um, outside large tenting areas uh, that we can look at that. But part of what we've challenged uh, John and Tom to do um, is take a look at the existing facility without those possibilities and see how we might be able to spread students out, social distance them in terms of doing that. So um, I would just ask Tom and John uh, if they would uh, comment on, you know, kind of their look at their buildings, again, without additional assistance uh, that we might get in terms of a definition uh, for um, uh, our ability to use a larger space and have more than 50 students in it, uh, which would be common sense. Uh, to all of us, but we still need to hear from the state uh, and or additional um, other ways that we might be able to facilitate um, students. So John and Tom, as you've taken a look at your building, do you want to comment on social distancing under a normal uh, option and perhaps a hybrid option as well? Yeah. I can go ahead and speak to that, Prentice. I appreciate the opportunity just to share. <clears throat> I think it's uh, Vernon Hills is unique in that as you walk into our building, we have a pretty spacious uh, area immediately inside our entrance, which leads directly to our cafeteria. Uh, so as long as we are able to take a large space like that and separate it, either with um, panels or some sort of makeshift or temporary wall, uh, you know, we, we could separate that space into four or so distinct areas. And if each of those can have 50, uh, then it's pretty easy to see that you could get 200 kids uh, eating in an area like that. Uh, as Prentice has said, we're still waiting on guidelines. And so we're not sure if we can take a space like that and separate it. If we cannot, then we're looking at uh, spilling over into facilities like gymnasiums, uh, auditorium stages, those types of things, uh, which are problematic in that they are further away from our cafeteria uh, and they impact more greatly other programs uh, within our curricular day. PE classes, uh, fine and performing arts classes, so on and so forth. As we look at our facility and think about tenting, uh, our school is under construction right now at Vernon Hills, and so the idea of placing tents on the exterior of the building becomes a little bit more problematic uh, as our space is being uh, kind of chewed up by some of the construction fences. Uh, still feeling, though, that if we were to be in some sort of a hybrid situation, something less than full capacity at our school, uh, we'd be in... Uh, a more comfortable position than, of course, if we were trying to feed uh, all 1,600 students. Uh, so uh, again, until we have more guidance about how we can separate areas, uh, it's hard to say with any definitive answer uh, how many students we can feed in our spaces. Um, uh, I would just add, along those same lines, um, when we look at Libertyville High School, we have a, um, a a little bit higher population than Vernon Hills and a different building altogether. Um, but with the state guidance of 50 students in a space, if we had all of our students back um, in our school at one time, uh, the biggest lunch we would have would be approximately um, uh, 400 to 450 students. And uh, that would mean all upwards of um, eight to nine individual spaces that could house 50 students and be adequate for lunch to be served. Um, so that's a tremendous challenge. And forgive me, I have an anxious dog here and um, he was making no noise until I started to talk. Um, if we go to half 
of our population in a hybrid model, we cut our lunch down. Our biggest lunch goes to about 225 to 250. So we're looking at uh, anywhere from four to five locations to house a group of 50 students and provide lunch. Um, you know, there's, there's two competing variables that we're all grappling with. And um, if you've listened to our public comments over the last couple meetings, you've heard both of those values um, clearly expressed. One is let's get our students in school because we know that um, that's where the educational excellence can be delivered. Their standards of excellence can be at their highest levels. Uh, but at the same time, let's keep our kids and our staff, um, let's maintain those highest standards of safety and health. And so um, when you think about this, especially with the cafeterias, you can come up with a lot of different options. Well, just give kids lunch in the classrooms and give kids lunch in these places and let kids go out for lunch or let them go home. Um, but depending on which one of those kind of uh, avenues you pursue, you tend to sacrifice one of those two variables, either the student safety or the high levels of excellence in education that you're trying to perform. So we've, we've been playing out all of these and study these. Libertyville has three different classroom sizes. Uh, our smallest classrooms are approximately 780 feet. We have classrooms that are uh, 900 and some feet and classrooms uh, that are a little bit over a thousand square feet. Um, we cannot do any kind of uh, social distance in our classrooms if all students are back. Um, most of our classrooms are uh, 25 to 28 students. Some are a little bit higher, some are a little bit less. Um, but uh, in those settings, you um, will have students sitting very close to one another uh, wearing masks. A hybrid model, um, while still bringing students into the building, allows us a greater degree of social distancing in the classrooms, which is where the students spend the majority of their time during the day. Um, so that's kind of how we've been exploring both of these scenarios. So John and Tom, can I just ask you to comment in a little more detail on one part of this? I mean, and I really want to do that for the purpose of having all of our participants to hear the specific answer. You mentioned actually, you know, lunch in classrooms. Other than the logistics of getting food, which I understand, well, I certainly can appreciate are substantial. I mean, is there any possible option to have, you know, one single common lunch period and everybody basically sits in place and has lunch at their desk? Yeah, that's, that, that's, that's something, Pat, that we did talk about in uh, our health and safety um, task force group. I'm not sure if Dan's going to weigh in on that later, but I, I think we did talk about it. The, the issue, there'd be a couple dynamics at play. One is if we could get all students to bring their own lunch, well, then that's, that's not too terribly difficult to do, right? As soon as we start to think about getting lunch to students who are spread out throughout the school, uh, that becomes um, logistically difficult. And if they're all eating at once, uh, the stress and pressure that puts on the food service personnel uh, to, you know, to, to get all those out at one time in a, um, you know, a, a, a smaller block of time, obviously the logistics of that become a little bit more um, yeah, troublesome. The other thing is, is just the supervision of all of those spaces, right? Yep. So if yep. you have, if you have students spread across the building, and you're also asking teachers, presumably at that time to eat as well, uh, then who's watching the children? We can't yep. have students unsupervised in spaces uh, where they're unstructured eating lunch. Uh, all spaces have to have adult supervision, especially in uh, some of these uh, requirements that we're being asked to facilitate with social distancing and the like, uh, students need uh, adult supervision. So we would not have the kind of staffing necessary to be able to have an adult in each of those spaces. Um, so that presents yet another problem. And that's to the, and from, I was on the, uh, most of my work and focus was on the scheduling committee uh, we talked about this um, and pursued a number of different options with it. Um, you know, one of the things that we wanted to do, though, was we want to provide as, um, as normal of a school schedule for students as possible. 
Um, and if you go to one lunch period for everyone, you have to build that time into the day. And that results in shorter academic classes for students um, because the way our, our schedules are currently structured is we have lunches being served during period four, five, six, and seven. And those are for um, students who, um, or excuse me, it's three through six with some students eating seven, pardon me. But um, not every student eats lunch during that time. So you might have 25% uh, of the school eating lunch during period three, but 75% of the kids are in an academic class at that time. So if you pull out time um, without sacrificing students' classes, um, if you pull out time and say, we need to add in an extra half hour or 45 minutes for a dedicated lunch period, you have no choice but to reduce then the time that students are in their academic classes throughout the rest of the day. Um, and that be problematic for us because um, 45 minutes um, is most teachers, it varies, but most teachers would say that's the minimal amount of time. They, many would like more time with students. Okay. All right. I just, I mean, I really just thought it was important to, to do a slightly deeper dive on that one because I think for many in the public that might seem like an obvious possible solution to this challenge. But I think, uh, uh, Pat, before we move on to the next point, um, you know, I want to give Kevin a shout out here, uh, Mr. Huber. Um, Kevin actually had a great suggestion about using, you know, large kind of wedding tents that could do two, three hundred people uh, as alternative spaces. And, and we are doing a deep dive on that, uh, looking at uh, options as one of those options. Um, and honestly, um, for either of these options, normal with adaptations, particularly normal with adaptations, but even hybrid blended, uh, bringing students into the cafeteria space. If we could use some larger spaces within our facilities, as, as John has laid out, I think I used the example of the, the new dance room, um, you know, in space we created in the old pool uh, at Libertyville, and we could divide those larger spaces up, uh, it'd be very helpful in terms of consideration. So we are running out all those ground balls. So we have you know, everything that we need, hopefully, for you to be able to make a decision uh, on uh, which way we are going to move. Uh, but, um, you know, we continue to ask ISBE and IDPH um, for that ad, uh, additional guidance on 50 in a space. So what goes against the grain of uh, probably common sense would be, okay, we get it, you can put, they're going to let us put 25 to 30 kids in a classroom, right? Um, but we can't put, you know, 200 kids in a space that's 10 times the square footage. And uh, it just kind of, um, it's almost incredulous um, that uh, we would have the same expectation for the space in a gym or a field house or John's common area at Vernon Hills. Uh, and we would have to hold to that 50 in a space. So uh, we're continuing to pursue that again. So we have you know, all the options and all the tools in the toolbox. Uh, Dan and his team are looking at alternative, you know, external structures, if you will, like tents uh, that we could uh, possibly use. So we've all, you know, again, got all those tools in the toolbox. But um, the, the struggle here, uh, perhaps for everyone, is that piece on social, social distancing. So if you put 50 kids on a school bus, you put 30 in a classroom, um, you know, is that, is that safe based on what IEPH has told us? And now they're saying that, uh, yes, we're going to go ahead and let you put 50 kids on a bus, 30 kids in a classroom, uh, limit other spaces to 50. Uh, desks don't have to be six feet apart, but do it if you can, uh, those types of things. And uh, as the principals look at the health and safety of their building, as we do that with them, as you do that with us, um, it becomes, um, you know, it is concerning. Um, um, just knowing what we think we've been taught uh, over the last uh, few months. So, um, so those pieces are germane to uh, both of these. Um, then, and Prince, just just one other comment. I mean, if I'm not mistaken, the hotel industry has pushed back pretty 
pretty hard on the 50 person per room requirement, especially given that they've got huge ballrooms and conference centers and things like that. And as far as I know, the governor has not given them any relief on that. Well, that's it. And Pat, that I don't know. Uh, well, I didn't hear that until you just shared that. But uh, I, I will say um, for every school in the state, uh, I don't care what size it is, if it has a cafeteria and it's got over 50 kids in the school, they're going to run into a very similar yeah, problem. Absolutely. So um, I do know that ISBE is aware uh, of, of that issue and hopefully in a coming guidance document, they're going to tackle that issue because what we'd like to do is really have all of the options uh, to look at. But I think what Tom and John are sharing with you this evening is if we don't have all those tools, uh, that there is concern uh, looking at their buildings about can we safely socially distance kids if all the kids are back in school. And certainly that would be a little bit more challenging than it would be in a hybrid schedule. Having said that, we're still running out other options um, just to see if we can have everything on the table uh, in looking our, at our decision making, whether we bring kids back normally or we bring kids back in a hybrid blended model. Okay. okay. All right. So the next, the next piece on here, so Kevin, thank you very much for your thinking on this because that is helpful to the big picture. Uh, liability insurance, um, school districts discovered several weeks ago across the state that COVID-19 is not covered under their liability policies, which are whether, whether you are in a large uh, insurance cooperative like we are, which is called CLIC, uh, probably the largest uh, in the state uh, moving forward, or if you are in a smaller group or you're self-insured, COVID-19 uh, uh, falls under some language in uh, liability insurance policies that doesn't cover schools. That's problematic. That is a big problem for us. So uh, we reached out to our local state legislators who were great uh, on a Friday afternoon or Friday before the July 4th holiday at uh, contacting some folks down uh, in Springfield for us. We totally understood the problem, um, understood the significance of the problem, and started reaching out to uh, their contacts. Uh, the following week, I received a call from general counsel for ISBE, uh, who assured me that yes, they are aware of the problem. They were starting to hear from more state legislators and more school superintendents, not surprisingly. Um, our initial thought was that perhaps the governor uh, could include schools in an executive order uh, that he made earlier in the year, which uh, basically held harmless uh, hospitals and uh, healthcare workers, first responders. Uh, we were told uh, that given language in the Illinois school code, which is the kind of the um, working set of legislation for schools, that uh, that probably was not a possibility that it would perhaps have to be a legislative um, a piece of legislation, which I'm sure most legislators across the state would be very supportive of. Uh, very challenging to look at opening school without liability for COVID-19 uh, insurance, uh, liability insurance. Um, Dan Stanley, our assistant superintendent for finance, reached out to our um, school law firm uh, just to have them uh, look at our insurance policy. Um, they validated that um, we and other Click schools are not uh, covered under liability insurance um, there. And then Dan took uh, the next extraordinary step of kind of looking out in the marketplace, institutional marketplace for liability insurance to see if perhaps we could buy a standalone policy, um, you know, for a short term, for a year. And uh, what he discovered is even Lloyd's of London uh, is not writing uh, COVID-19 uh, policies for any um, price. So I think our best hope at this point is that uh, the legislative leadership, who I'm told is uh, aware of the problem, uh, certainly local legislators are becoming aware of the problem through their local school superintendents, um, can um, get some fast track legislation going, which would hold school districts harmless. Now, one other important point here is that um, there is a much higher threshold for somebody to uh, prove um, that, um, you know, a school district is liable for, for COVID, uh, it really falls into that kind of willful and wanton neglect. So 
uh, in our case, we willfully made a decision not to follow um, ISB and IDPH guidance, for example, uh, and somebody could prove that. That being said, um, so that is true. That being said, um, what uh, law firms could do is uh, even if they might not prevail at the end, they could drag school districts through a legal process over a longer period of time, which would cost substantial money uh, that many school districts don't have. Um, and you never know in a liability case at the end of the day if you're gonna prevail or not. So um, that is our concern with liability insurance. The board is aware of that. We're gonna let the, make sure that the community uh, is aware of that as part of the decision-making. Um, and um, also one more shout out to Kevin. Kevin's uh, got some great contacts in Springfield. Uh, was very helpful and kind of working parallel uh, with me on this problem. So very appreciative of that. And uh, I think we're at a point where we've both been told the same thing, and that is they're working on it, uh, and we need to let them do their job. Uh, Kevin, would that, that would be correct. You can just nod if you're, <laughs> I think. That is, yes, that's 100% correct. And you said it very nicely then Springfield. Did. Yes, okay. So uh, hopefully uh, we're gonna move forward from there. Okay, so collective bargaining. Uh, we had a comment on collective bargaining before. Uh, I talked about that for um, a, a couple of minutes, but really collective bargaining in this case is the school, the school board makes the decision on how we're gonna open. And then we have a legal obligation to bargain the impact of that that may be different from a teacher standard contract. So the only comment, of course, you know, we can't share what's going on in collective bargaining uh, in a public forum uh, and the union can't either. But what I will tell you that in good spirit, uh, almost immediately uh, when we were ready to do that, uh, our union uh, has sat down with us three times. We have another session scheduled tomorrow. We're likely to meet probably every day or every other day uh, and continue to move that uh, ball down um, the court. I don't want the community to be confused that this is like negotiations that we have every two or three years for a teacher contract where we're, bar where we're bargaining a uh, teacher raise, perhaps benefits, you know, other working conditions, um, moving forward, this is a different type of negotiations that's specifically around the impact. Now, it can involve monetary issues, but it is not, um, you know, bargaining for a teacher um, salary or a salary increase of another two or three percent a year, for example. Uh, it is not that. So we just want to make sure that we're clear with that. Okay, so before we leave this slide, and then uh, I'm going to turn this over to Rita. Um, again, we want the board to have all the tools in the toolbox to be able to make their decision, all the information that they need. So normal with adaptations, again, a normal school year, you know, we've, we've been doing as long as we've had a school district here. So we know how to do the normal opening, the adaptations, which would be you know, self-assessment before you come to school, temperature checks, um, um, a mask, uh, PPE that would go with part of that uh, in those adaptations. Dan is going to cover a little bit later in the presentation under um, health and safety. Okay, so we've highlighted what we think are probably the largest, biggest challenges uh, with a normal with adaptations open. Um, and then um, some of those issues also cross into hybrid blended, okay? So um, next, um, we're going to start um, digging into the teaching and learning work group, and that's gonna take us into the hybrid schedule uh, and talking about that. It's gonna talk about um, the um, enhanced remote um, learning that we will have, which is our e-school um, moving forward. And uh, we just wanna make sure that people understand it is not the remote learning with the expectations and requirements that we had from the state last spring. Um, it is um, our version planned that we would move uh, forward from um, there. So unless there are any questions on uh, the first part of the presentation, uh, we're gonna turn it over to Rita and any of the other administrators who may join into that conversation. So we good to make that transition? Yes? Okay, uh, all right, Rita. 
This Thank is Dr. Pranath. Rita Fisher, is Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction. Thank you, Pranath. Um, Brian, if you can advance to the next slide. Um, I, uh, helped, I facilitated the teaching and learning work group with Ray Alban and Joe O'Brien, who are assistant principals at uh, Libertyville and Vernon Hills. And we convened as a work group early in June um, with 20 members uh, representing, they were, our 20 members are students, teachers, administrators, support staff members, and a board member. And each of our members really well represented various perspectives of uh, the communities that they are part of, that they serve, and uh, their colleagues as well. So um, our work began really reflecting on and recognizing uh, the spring emergency remote learning and the challenges associated with that. We also began reflecting on the excellent world-class education that D128 is all about. Um, at, at teaching and learning is what we do and we do it very well. And so we started with a driving question that focused on the realities of the 2021 school year and the uncertainties that we would face in 2021. We wanted to, our question was how might we design an e-school model that is focused on that effective teaching and learning um, that we do in the district that, is, that was also nimble and is adaptable for use in any of the scenarios we might face, including the original scenario that the e-learning was designed for, something as simple as a snow day. And so if you'll move to the next uh, slide, Brian, we uh, coined the term e-school. And we use that term and, uh, to describe any type of e-learning that might occur during the 2021 school year. And we wanted that situation not to be an emergency like it was in the spring, but to be deliberately planned for and to represent really the best of what we do in District 128. Um, realizing that legislation that followed um, required us to develop a remote and a re blended remote learning plan and to publish that, our work on eSchool became that form of guidance. So we have developed a guidance document that will be public and will be published once it is complete. And um, uh, we've worked through uh, the union, through negotiations, the impact of any of that. But um, our intent as a work group was to be fully prepared, our administration, our teachers, our students, to be fully prepared for the 2021 school year, whether we're in person, fully in person, and dealing with any learning losses that might have been experienced during the spring, whether we're in a blended situation that we'll describe in detail, or whether uh, we are required to be in a fully remote learning situation. We also uh, included in that guidance uh, plans for if a snow day is called in January or February. So. Um, that was the ultimate purpose of our teaching and learning group. And again, the, the 20 members of the group and all the various perspectives that were represented spent a lot of time talking about many of the questions that you've heard asked today. Um, when we move on to the next slide and talk about our goals, we really focused on this notion of continuity of learning. Um, knowing that there were learning losses perhaps in the spring, knowing that e-learning in an emergency situation was not the best teaching and learning that we uh, can do given the guidance and the um, practices that we were followed as a result, uh, that we would have to address what happened in the spring, even if we are fully in person learning as we open the school year. We'd also have to address that as the school year began if we were in a hybrid situation, if we had to move to a fully remote situation, and if we used a snow day. So focusing on what is the best as a community that we do in terms of teaching and learning, and how do we do that in any one of the scenarios um, was really our, our goal together. We wanted to be sure that we had clear guidelines for any type of e-learning that may occur um, in our e-school guidance. Um, we wanted to be sure that to the extent we could, we established really consistent practices across any of the scenarios so that students, families, teachers, administrators would know um, what to expect as we transitioned perhaps 
from one schedule to another. Um, we also um, reviewed all of the survey feedback that was given in the spring related to spring, spring learning and understood the importance of scheduling time for connections between students and their teachers if we were in e-school. Um, and so uh, we worked with the scheduling group to make sure that our goals matched the schedules that they were designing when eventually the two groups joined together as one. Um, part of that uh, um, goal of our work too was, as I said earlier, to ensure that, that we really had smooth transitions between any form of e-school that might occur. So um, the strategies that we developed in our e-school guidance included um, guidelines um, that really um, encouraged this focus on what we do best in D128, our D128 Daring Standards of Learning, so that we um, ensured that throughout the 2021 school year, we were aware of developing curriculum that was uh, our, our curriculum that we offer in D128 that we addressed and um, responded to the needs for the coming school year, which will be different from prior uh, school years. So designing highly effective curriculum based on our curriculum standards in the district, um, making sure that our instructional strategies and assessment strategies uh, were the best that they could be in any kind of e-school setting. Um, we um, talked with the scheduling group um, and they had been independently working on making sure that any schedule that we built included scheduled time for synchronous meetings between students and staff. Um, and that asynchronous learning would continue um, the learning that happened when teachers and students were together with independent inquiry and application of learning. When we talked about synchronous learning, we specifically described that as scheduled time when students and teachers are together in the same setting, whether it is in person or whether it is in a scheduled virtual meeting. Asynchronous learning is learning that occurs in e-school when students are not with their teachers, but teachers have planned for them the activities and strategies that they will be using to learn independently, planned for them and communicated them with their students. We understood that communication um, came in various forms in the spring and we uh, recommended as a group that we use a common platform such as Google Classroom to initially communicate our expectations for students um, through that platform so that we would have consistency in that communication. We also talked about the fact that in the spring, uh, our grading practices were not the same grading practices as pre-spring, pre that our grading practices were impacted by the guidance from the state um, and uh, the, the concern that this emergency situation could potentially do harm to students with grades. And so knowing that we're going to begin the 2021 school year without that guidance and without any existing grades, we recommended a return to some teacher professionalism in grading, as well as some common practices um, that would help students and their families understand how they were making progress, whether we were in person or in e-school. And finally, we talked a lot about the need for our teachers to gather for professional learning time and support to prepare for the 2021 school year and how we would uh, provide the necessary opportunities for that to occur. So all of those strategies came into play in the guidance that will be public, will be our state required remote and blended remote learning plan and will be available and um, also uh, will be something that as a district, we make, make sure that uh, we have time with our staff to ensure that the guidance is appropriate, is understood, and is practiced. The teaching and learning group joined with the scheduling group, which had, which had been operating independently uh, under um, the guidance of Tom Colentes, Andy Young, and Oli Stevens. And uh, their um, 
driving question related to our work was how might we design an ideal e-school schedule in blended, fully remote, and emergency scenarios. And they spent a lot of time, as Tom can uh, respond to, spent a lot of time with their members, which also included students, teachers, administrators, support staff members, um, developing multiple scenarios and schedules um, that could potentially um, work in any situation and recommended a hybrid schedule that we're gonna talk about next for the hybrid situation. If the school were to open in a hybrid um, setting, the hybrid setting would um, be accomplished by splitting the student body roughly in half um, with, a, with an alpha split that is still being discussed and with goals of keeping families together, um, and dividing the student population as equally as possible. Um, the hybrid schedule, um, many of the participants of that group felt strongly that when in-person days did occur, that it was important to have all eight periods of the day held on those in-person days. So in the alpha split, um, students in group A attend school one day and have, according to this diagram, group B attend school on uh, group, sorry, group A attend school in person and group B is uh, learning um, asynchronously. The result of the one day on, one day off scheduling scenario is that all students have two in-person days per week for all of their eight scheduled classes. The yeah, third could, sorry, if I could just interject um, with this, the, there's a lot of um, people that have, may have seen other schools, a lot of high schools have published hybrid schedules. Um, some high schools have created models where one group of kids come for the whole week and another group is off doing e-learning for a whole week and they switch. Others divide their kids into thirds or to fourths. Um, for us, we um, had real clear feedback from students and from teachers that the number one thing was uh, frequent contact each week. And so this was the schedule that maximized uh, student contact with teachers um, each week. And our students felt very strongly that when they came to school, they wanted to go through their eight period day to see all of their teachers and to be in all of their classes. So, thank you, Tom. So this schedule accomplishes that and it does um, also um, have consistencies um, in terms of the contact time between students and their teachers uh, that can be found in our extended e-school schedule where that could potentially be used if we were in fully remote learning. So, um, the, the notion that for every class that students are in, they are seeing their teachers in person twice a week during this hybrid schedule, as Tom said, was really important to the members of that group. And it's achieved by having the alternating days, attending all eight class periods and having teacher contact two days per week with uh, asynchronous learning occurring on three days per week. The um, asynchronous day on Wednesday provides time for our teachers to gather in uh, professional learning communities and in the morning as they normally do on Wednesday. It also provides a time for a, a deep cleaning of the building and provides time for scheduled individual and independent meetings between students and teachers. Each of the, um, each of the days in the hybrid schedule would continue throughout subsequent weeks. In weeks when there was a, a holiday or a day off of school, uh, the asynchronous day would not take place. And there still would be the two um, days of personal contact with teachers in all classes. Rita, can I ask a question? Yes. Um, and this is just a logistics question. 
So what what's the rationale behind not having group A go Monday, Tuesday, and group B go Thursday, Friday? If you're going to deep clean on Wednesday, wouldn't, I mean, <laughs> I don't, can't think of a better way to say this, but wouldn't you want like the same set of germs to be there Monday and Tuesday, then clean, then have the same group of kids in the building for two days? It, it seems like a lot of back and forth. So I'm just looking for the rationale behind um, Tom can talk more about the discussions that occurred regarding that, but um, the idea that the, the idea that um, the day one and the day two really um, makes up a two-day lesson that teachers would design and implement so that students were in person receiving instruction and they were applying that learning um, on the asynchronous day. And so the idea that you were alternating provided the opportunity for teachers to really have more direct and immediate contact with students regarding what they would be doing in the asynchronous day and how they would be learning on that subsequent day um, is the rationale that we've talked about. Tom can expand further on that. Yeah, I would, I, we were right there with you, Rita, in terms of that. And then the other thing was, again, just the value was teachers and students didn't want extended time away from each other. They wanted to, they felt there was value in seeing each other frequently. Um, and so rather than, you know, I don't see, I don't see my, if I'm with my A kids, I don't see my B kids for three days. Uh, and then I'm with my B kids and I don't see my A kids for three days. Um, the every other day rotation was more desirable for the, the representatives on the schedule committee. Hey, Tom, this is Kevin. Hi, Kevin. Hey, and this is a question for, I guess, you and Rita. So before you put up the hybrid, and Rita knows this question's coming, you, you may or may not. So uh, before you put up the hybrid schedule, you talked about clear, consistent, smooth, and also connections. Those are some of the words I took from the previous slide. And when looking at this hybrid schedule, it started in June with me, and it continues to this day. I, I just don't understand why we have to have two separate groups and two groups of learning. I know we have to split the kids up, but why can't we not have some type of a live stream or some type of a technology vehicle that's in the classroom so that the kids get to see the teacher basically every day? And the kids in that class learn together every day. And in essence, it, again, it just doesn't make sense that this is a better hybrid solution. Again, understanding hybrid is cutting everything in half physically. But learning wise, with a, again, a live stream type of, and again, I don't know the technology, there's people a heck of a lot smarter than me. But with the technology that we have, and with our daring mission, I just don't see this being the best hybrid type of approach that's out there. I, I would say, uh, and I'm jumping in to answer your question, Kevin, I know you directed it initially at, uh, at Tom, but um, I would say that this schedule wouldn't uh, preclude um, something like that, but it's designed to support um, learning at home as well as learning in the classroom. So the mechanics of how the schedule is implemented are still under discussion, um, but it would not, what you suggest is not precluded by the schedule itself. And I think, okay. I, think I agree with that, that a teacher, um, uh, may very well have the option of doing that and may choose to do that. Um, but I would also say, Kevin, the thing to understand is how radically different high school curriculum is today than maybe what some of us experienced when we were younger. When I was a student, most of my high school classes were lecture driven. Um, I can literally remember teachers opening up files and taking out yellow pages of notes and joking about how they gathered dust because they'd been using them for 15 years. And a lot of my teachers stood at the front of the board, they uh, lectured and we wrote notes down. That translates very well to um, a kind of live stream, right? And that's why a lot of universities with their big professors and lecture halls can do that. What's happening in our classrooms today is yes, teachers still lecture sometimes, but the vast majority of time, and you've seen this from the furniture that we have in our rooms, kids are in pods, kids are in small groups, kids are doing analysis at their desks, at their tables by re close reading documents, talking to each other about what they mean. Um, 
that is very difficult to live stream home to students at home and to have students at home hear all of the conversations that are happening in the different corners of the room um, and to see the different kind of presentations that students are making. Um, it can be done, but it creates an unnatural sense in the classroom where everyone who's talking would have to make sure that they're on microphone. Everybody who's presenting would have to make sure they're up in the front delivering it so that everyone at home could see it. Um, so certainly uh, that technology may exist, but I personally haven't seen the types of real interactive collaborative lessons that we strive for in our classrooms that we know boost student learning being done effectively in a live stream model to that degree. Um, Tom, this is Lisa. Just wanted to um, follow up on that because I think you make a really good point. But my concern is if we have to switch to an e-learning model, how do all of those carefully crafted lessons that involve the teacher being present in a room with students get adapted? Yeah. So um, I'll let Rita chime in on this as well. Uh, but that is something that our teachers are working on. You can never replace, in my opinion, you know, I know this is hard for a lot of people to understand because you think, well, I could take my meeting and I'll just put it on Zoom. And a meeting is a place where it does very well in a Zoom environment because it tends to be one person talking, one person presenting, and information being transmitted. But again, the challenge that we face if we move into an, a full-time e-learning model is how do we create the great types of connections where students are interacting with students and um, with staff in uh, smaller settings. So that's why some of the, e when you see the extended e-school schedule, you're gonna see that it is designed differently with the opportunity for teachers to create their time differently and use their time differently so that they can um, create options for breakout rooms or for different students to present at different times for that learning to be shared and as much as possible be much more of a collaborative space for students rather than a passive place where I'm just receiving information. Yeah, I, and I would just I would just add that um, you know we do have um, many teachers who uh, record the direct instruction part of their lessons and then use the um, in-person or synchronous virtual meetings to support the kind of collaboration that Tom was talking about as well. There are multiple different ways of replicating the teacher instruction and the student application and collaboration. Um, obviously, the best way to do that is in person. Um, the next best, best way to do that is to plan for it in a virtual setting. Um, and, and so with you know, having clear lear learning goals in mind and the time to adapt really excellent in-person lessons to virtual lessons is how we believe the 2021 school year will be different from the very emergency, um, you know, one day of being in school and then the, you know, the next day we were not in school any longer. Uh, that doesn't provide the kind of time and space necessary to take those really excellent lessons that are delivered in our classroom and to adapt them for a remote setting. So Rita, if I understand the hybrid schedule as presented on this slide, has a teacher in the building replicating the same experience two days in a row for two different cohorts? Yeah. Yes, potentially. That, that would be the way most teachers would approach it. And again, I hesitate to say exactly yes, because we have so many different teachers, so many different disciplines, so many different um, really excellent professionals who can better tell you how they would structure those A and B days. But really the intent is that uh, the students would receive the same experience from their teachers, whether they were in group A or group B. Okay. All right. Hey, Rita, <laughs> go ahead, Kelly. Sorry about that. Uh, so again, and I, I just have to push back on this because I'm I am 100% confident that the community expect, expected when they thought about hybrid that half the kids would be in class and the other half, in essence, would be watching it somehow. Okay. And we, we are we're really talking about is five days a week, whether you're watching the teacher, because again, 
remember, we also have to address kids under scenario A. If we go back full force, we're going to have 10 to 15 percent of the kids who aren't, uh, for health reasons, cannot go back. We may have another 10 to 15 percent who are uncomfortable going back. So we may have up to 30 percent of our kids who will not be stepping foot in uh, under the either scenario A or B. So, you know, at the end of the day, I, I still have to push back on everybody that I'm going to argue that seeing the teacher five days a week, whether it's in person or on some type of a technology vehicle and having that teacher present the lesson plan each day to the whole group and then having the kids go as a whole group because I know the kids work collaboratively at night and I know that, that 20 kids in the classroom will be working collaboratively at oh. night. And when you're having 10 do one project and 10 do another project, that is not clear to me. That is not consistent to me. That is not smooth to me. And that really doesn't make connections among 20 kids in that class, whether it's uh, freshman algebra or AP calculus. So I'm really gonna struggle. And again, I, I believe people know, at least I know Prentice knows and Rita knows that I'm gonna really struggle supporting this hybrid schedule and, and I, do, and I just want to apologize before, and just let you all know that, that this one really, for me, and I'm just one of seven, this one for me is really a non-starter. So let, let, let's try to dig into, let's try to dig into that in a little more detail. Um, because I think what we want to try to do is figure out what reassurances can we give the community that the, when these kids are not in the classroom three days a week, that they're going to still get a solid five days of, of, uh, of education. I mean, how can, how can we address that? Well, if I may, um, Kevin, your, your concern makes an assumption that synchronous learning with teachers and students watching on a screen is, is the best type of education. And um, the research doesn't yet support that. It actually supports both synchronous and asynchronous learning. And what you, I think, expect of us is you, you would expect us to say whatever, um, whatever we're doing, what stays consistent, no matter what model we go to, e-learning, hybrid, or full insight learning, the standards of academic excellence have to be high. We have to maintain those standards. What we're uh, attempting to do is adapt the instructional delivery in, a myriad, in myriad different ways to maintain those high standards of instruction. So you may find in one classroom, a teacher may completely agree with you and have it set up where the students are logged in every single day. They're monitoring that class, they're participating in that class, whether they're in, on site or they're at home by taking notes and paying attention. Um, that, that is an option potentially for our staff. But you would want me, I believe, as an educator to say, you know what, that is not valuable for your student to sit and listen to this because they're not gonna get out of it what they could do if I design a well-structured asynchronous learning activity for them to do. And the difference in the spring and now is, in the spring we were under national emergency where we couldn't hold students and staff in a position of accountability for this because everyone was dealing with health and responsiveness to family, to uh, losing jobs, to taking care of their health. So we couldn't plan these types of things because we had very little notice. And it, many of our teachers did. Many of our teachers created outstanding kind of group or asynchronous activities or synchronous moments. But when kids would go to log on, they wouldn't have their whole class there. And um, that was difficult. And so under this new framework, everyone is accountable for being um, uh, engaged with the learning, for being present and accountable when they need to be, and for conducting the work. And I think you would see that um, our teachers would develop a number of different strategies that would be innovative and adaptive, but that would keep high levels of excellence in academics as the prime focus. What, what is the plan for attendance and, and meeting clock time requirements on the asynchronous days? The asynchronous days, uh, students complete an attendance form and they are, um, they are uh, responsible for logging into their Google Classroom and completing the um, 
work that teachers have posted in Google Classroom and or have um, developed with them in person on, uh, on their in-person day. Um, so students are expected to complete um, on their asynchronous day, whether it's in the hybrid schedule or any asynchronous day in the um, schedule, complete attendance and to complete the expectations of each teacher um, that are in Google Classroom and or explained in person. Can I ask would so, they be doing when synchronous oh. meetings are held? So we do, we might want to, we can review the um, extended e-school uh, schedule as well. Uh, when synchronous meetings are held, they are scheduled um, according to the schedule that was developed not in the spring as they were offered by teachers at various times that, you know, again, occasionally could have been in conflict with other classes because we did not develop a schedule for synchronous meetings in the spring. Um, for 2021, if students are in a fully extended e-school, and maybe we want to flip, uh, advance to the next slide. Um, if students are in an extended e-school, um, the periods are broken up into blocks, um, periods zero through four uh, in one day and periods five through eight in the next. And um, they have scheduled times for each of their class periods for scheduled synchronous meetings and attendance is required at those meetings. So students um, on both of these schedules have um, in-person scheduled time twice a week and asynchronous blocks of time uh, three days a week with each of their class periods. They're just broken up differently on the extended e-school um, with the intent in the extended e-school of providing daily focus for students, a longer period of time for um, these scheduled meetings and more focus on four periods of the day. Um, so that the schedule can also include a lunch break so that students aren't, you know, eight hours in front of their um, computer and uh, resource time for individual meetings uh, and support of students as needed. So this is the extended e-school schedule. Um, so if students are in asynchronous learning on this schedule, they're completing their attendance via a Google form they are um, meeting for each of their four class or each of the four periods that are meeting that day. There are scheduled synchronous meetings and there's also an asynchronous day on Wednesday in this uh, schedule for uh, teachers to follow up and meet with students individually for additional support, for makeups, for redos, for um, many of the different reasons why you would want to meet with a student individually. Yeah, I took a, uh, just two other quick things um, to your point, Rita, um, was the, the committee here felt the block was much more important in extended eSchool because we wanted to maximize the time that students and staff would be together. Um, when you only have 30 minutes or 45 minutes and you're working online, it takes five to 10 minutes for people to log in. Um, every conversation moves much more slowly. And so we wanted to make sure that the time was longer so that the teachers could do the types of things that Lisa was talking about of how do you facilitate group work or these discussions in a remote environment. The other thing that's important is you see we built in the resource time every day and the lunch period every day. So um, keeping health and wellness as a priority for lunch, everyone has a lunch period. And then the resource is a time that teachers could develop and the school could develop different types of touch points and interventions for students who um, e-learning is difficult for and is challenging for. Uh, this would give us an intervention period or a touch base period that we didn't have available to us in the spring, where whether it was one individual child or small groups of children could be scheduled to meet with different professionals in our building, whether that was a counselor, or whether that was a social worker, whether that is their classroom teacher, their pause teacher, um, you know, that would be a time for us to do different types of webinars with seniors around their college process or with freshmen around their transition process. This schedule oh. also 
takes into account that there are scheduled meetings for each of those class periods and that work uh, that students will do, be doing application and asynchronous work outside of those uh, scheduled class periods as well for the full five o'clock hour day. Rita, Casey here. I, I have a question. I just want to confirm. So this is kind of the same as the hybrid option where they're teaching the same lesson twice in one week, correct? No. no. In this case, no. they are continuing uh, learning five days a week. Some of it, as, as is the case in the hybrid schedule as well. But in, in this case, students are meeting face-to-face -face, uh, twice a week for each period and continuing their learning independently, doing their applications for the, uh, the three remaining days of the week where they're not having scheduled synchronous meetings. I'm just trying to wrap my head around how we get five days worth of learning into all this. Um, yeah. We do, and, and so, so in the hybrid schedule, if students are meeting every other day, they are doing a two-day lesson. So they are moving forward each day. They're replicating two days worth of work, whether part of it is in person and part of it is asynchronous. So in that schedule, students are moving through five days of instruction just in different ways. It's almost it, it's almost a college setup where you go to class two or less than five days a week, and mo most of your work is actually being done outside the classroom. And I I would challenge that for freshmen in high school that might be a little yeah. bit of. A, oh, that's a good point. Uh, you know, I I can see my twenty year old does just fine with that, but that's not who we're talking about here. Um, uh, Tom, what I, did you want to say? The I thought the 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 difference is in the hybrid. In the hybrid, you're dividing your class in half. So a teacher is teaching to group A one day and group B the next. In this model, all the kids are together in the same class period. So once the teacher teaches the lesson, he or she is ready to advance to the next lesson. Where in the hybrid, because you've only taught the lesson to half, then the next day you're potentially reteaching it to that other half. Right, but in the hybrid, it is a, if you're doing it that way, that is a two-day lesson, right? So it represents the work, the direct instruction is in one day, but the application is in the next. So you're not teaching only half of the curriculum in the hybrid model, which is what your, you know, your, I think your question assumes. Yes. So you're teaching the entire curriculum, but the in-person portion is twice a week, just as it is in extended e-school with the asynchronous part of the learning occurring when students are not meeting directly with their teachers. Yeah, hey Rita, one question uh, back to the hybrid model. So if I'm in the in the Monday cohort, for example, um, I'm face to face with my teacher in the classroom. Tuesday, Tuesday at home, I'm doing my work. But if I if I need to access my teacher, my teacher has got a full day teaching the B cohort. So how do I how do I know I'm actually going to have the access that I want? Excellent question. Yeah, and on those days, it might be akin to a weekend where, um, you know, you get some learning on Friday and you have some questions about that. The next time you're in person with the teacher is when you have the face-to-face -face opportunity to answer those questions. Well, then how is the asynchronous day effective for that student then? If they, if they are at a point where they can't essentially teach themselves anymore, they have to wait till the next time they see the teacher for someone that's there on Monday. That could be two days of them not understanding the material. I mean, I'm, I'm not really wrapping my head around that part. Yeah, I would say that uh, teachers would still um, have opportunities during potential planning um, hours to address really urgent questions like that. But their main focus on an uh, in-person day is on the students who are in person that day. It's possible that uh, teachers will give a lesson on that first day um, and then have kids work um, not independently but work in groups the next day. Um, so the lesson you teach what it is that they need to do. It could be design and experiment. Uh, it could be uh, identifications of rocks or minerals. It could be uh, learning how to um, write a paragraph or a structured paragraph 
And then the following day, that's what those kids are doing, but they're not necessarily doing it in isolation. I would gather that many teachers would assign kids to have their own Zoom meetings and do that group work the next day. Yeah. And if a student has a question, it's very much like they would have any other time. They don't always have access to their teachers. They can email a teacher. Teachers can respond to those students if they have questions. Um, but I, I really think that uh, the, the group time, which is what teachers have worked into the curriculum now, uh, again, why we purchase furniture so that kids could work in groups, uh, is going to become very important um, so that teachers de deliver a lesson. And then on that asynchronous day, it's not that the kids aren't doing anything. They're continuing forward, but they're working together the same way they would be in a classroom. The downside, of course, is they don't have immediate access to their teacher the, the way they would if we were in the perfect situation, which would be no COVID-19. Thank you for that teacher example, John. Our teachers in the work groups as well provided multiple. And the reason I hesitate sometimes to speak for all is that all of our teachers do not teach or plan in the same way. And that we have, we have multiple examples of how our teachers will plan for in-person learning and how to extend that learning beyond. But they also will require some time to effectively plan for any one of these scenarios. Yeah. All right, hey, it's time to can, can I ask a question? Um, I'm confused about the Wednesday. Uh, in terms of yeah. more clarity, yeah. as the, the purpose just, of the just, Wednesday. So well, just so that they're not required to go to class at a particular time, like they would be if they were on eight, the Tuesday or Monday asynchronous days. It's like a just a day to do work that they've been assigned from the previous two. This is on hybrid. Um, it's on. It's on either one. I think, Karen. So if I'm a student that goes to school on Monday in person, and then I have assignments to do on Tuesday and asynchronous learning, then on my asynchronous, but then I'm actually have to sign into class, right? At specific times and show that I'm attending. Is that true? The asynchronous days attendance is handled via a Google form. But that's the, the asynchronous. So what about the, the, the day when everyone is asynchronous learning, they still attend that during that particular time. So do they have, do the teachers give like two days worth of work to the kids who come on Monday? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let, let me ask it this way. I know in some districts I've read about that with their hybrid or, ASIN, or uh, fully virtual schedules, in week one, I might meet my teacher three times. In week two, I meet them two times, and then, you know, it kind of flips. So, what was the what what was the logic between that kind of approach versus the one we're recommending here, which is basically two days in class, one day out of class, or three days out of class for everybody? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, from the scheduling standpoint, um, both are possible. Uh, what you're just rotating, you're doing a, you know, over a course of two weeks, every student sees their teacher five times uh, yeah. and is in asynchronous five times. Uh, we felt as, um, as there are so many unknowns with this model, um, a couple of things. One was a real need to maintain health and safety with shutting the building down, making sure everything, every handrail, every bathroom was deep clean. Um, in a way that goes beyond what we do in a regular uh, after school evening setting. Um, and two, teachers and professionals still have a myriad of different student needs that are developed and happening uh, in a hybrid model that in an asynchronous day, they would be allowed to work to support in different ways. And many of our students um, would still be able to meet with the staff on an asynchronous day through requesting staff work on those days, um, their regular work day. They're available uh, to meet potentially with students in terms of small group settings or individual settings or office hour settings that would be appropriate for that time, as well as being able to meet with other colleagues to continue to develop curriculum, to adapt their practices, to implement some of the technologies that they're trying to implement in order to run a hybrid model. Right, so again, like that, that, that makes, go ahead, Don. Yeah. I'd like to see a lot more structure for that day. Um, 
uh, some sort of uh, way of building into that one day schedule where students could find teachers in office hours, for example, um, so that they knew that on any given day, they could go see their teacher or on the, any given Wednesday, they could go see their teacher for um, a block of time. And you may have teachers that are redoing lessons with students uh, who are, um, I, I, sorry, I got distracted by a, a note there. Um, so I would just like to see that there's some sort of um, consistency in that so that you don't have the history teacher and the science teacher both saying, I'm going to meet with my students from uh, 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock and then a kid has to choose what, what is he going to do. Um, also, something that came up in those um, meetings was that not every week is a five day week. And because not every week is a five day week, that was the sacrificial day. Um, so if you have a, a Monday that is a, um, a holiday, then that automatically becomes that asynchronous learning day and then the other four days go uh, unobstructed. Um, and there's also built into the schedule, uh, the ISBE has allowed additional training days. So when you put the training days plus the um, professional learning days plus uh, the holidays, um, it's, it's actually not going to be meeting as often as we think it is that Wednesday. So it makes, and it all makes perfect sense to me why we need that time actually to sort of check how this is going, adjust how it's going, spend some more time with our staff to develop and stuff. I just, again, I think we're trying to reassure the community that from the student perspective, they're still going to get everything that they, they need to get. Um, yeah. Yeah, Pat, let me, I'm sorry. Where are you going? I've been trying. So this will be my last statement on the hybrid because I think I've, I've beaten it. But, uh, you know, we are in a crisis situation. I think we all know that. There, there's no question we're in that crisis situation. And Tom talked about, you know, the research about asynchronized versus synchronized. It's not, de it's not defined and it's certainly not definite, which is better and which is not. And Tom also talked about the way most of us learned. And so you always go back to what you're comfortable with, with the way you learn. And so that's probably why, again, I'm pushing relatively hard on this concept. But, you know, again, I, I think all things being equal, I think, in fact, I know that teaching the old school way, if that has to be done, where kids get curriculum every day from a teacher. And again, our teachers are smart enough and technology has changed since I went to Libertyville High School from 82 to 86, it'll be a heck of a lot better experience that I just, again, I don't see this hybrid model being better than in a crisis situation. I, I'm just not comfortable with the risk of synchronized, asynchronized, and more like that. So again, I'm going to push back to you all. And if the board, as a board member, I'm going to ask later on if we can give you the technology to make a different hybrid happen. I'd like to see you try to do that, or at least give at least give me a different option. And again, I'm only one vote. So at the end of the day, if it's six one, Kevin, shut up. I'm good with that, hundred percent, because it's democracy. But again, I think we all have to put our hats on and go. This is a crisis. We need to teach the kids a curriculum. Pat pointed out one hundred percent. How do we get everybody comfortable? It may not be the best. And this may be, Tom, your, your hybrid may be ultimately better, but I don't know if I'm willing, and I know we're supposed to be daring, but I don't know if Kevin's willing to take that risk. I am, I am willing to take a risk on technology and live streaming to get the same, to get a, a product that I would know would work. So that's all I'm gonna say on hybrid. I'm sorry for beating, it, beating this topic. I'm gonna shut up now, I promise. Yeah. Hey, Don, Can I jump so, in so, here? Uh, go ahead, Jim. Yep. Yeah. So, I, and and I appreciate your comments, Kevin, and and I'll sort of respectfully disagree with uh, some of your premise, uh, and just sort of voice a a, a few comments. Um, and it just so happens to be a topic that I've done a bit of research lately on, in terms of uh, online learning, and the concern I would have for doing um, that type of continuous synchronous video you know broadcast of every classroom it's twofold one would be 
you're distracting from the potential for learning that could happen in the classroom. And one of the things that a lot of research talks about is when you have the students in the classroom is to maximize the value of that time. And maximizing the value of that time means interacting with the students. And this is sort of a, in the hybrid mode, you almost have a, a, a great opportunity because you have smaller groups of students that you can interact with in a much different manner than you could if there was 20 or 30 students in the classroom. So you can maximize that, that hour, that 45 minutes or whatever in that hybrid schedule with those students in that classroom and really get the biggest bang for the buck with that versus if you're streaming and you're just standing up and basically lecturing most of the time, uh, you're not maximizing the time. You you don't, if if it's good enough for the students to watch from home, then why even bring those other students into the classroom? Because that, you know, if, if we're trying to, to, to be as safe as possible, and if you're going to the lowest do common denominator here where students theoretically could get as much out of that classroom session by watching at home as you would by going into the building, then why shouldn't everybody stay at home? So that's, that's the, the, the first comment on that. And the second is just the idea of a student starting their day at eight o'clock or whatever that is, whatever the hybrid schedule is, and literally sitting in front of a, a, uh, their screen and watching classroom after classroom after classroom of activity in the school, knowing that they're not participating in nearly the same way that those students in that classroom are. And by the end of that day, you know, I, I can't imagine that there's much comprehension or much attention or much learning actually happening at, at that point in time. So I think the risk, while, while it may seem like it's efficient to have all the students learning and seeing the same thing at the same time, it actually becomes less efficient and, and not as, as, as robust, especially given, as, as Tom was mentioning, that the very different way in which we learn and the very different way in which we, we uh, have uh, the, the students actually achieve in a classroom. Uh, it, it's just a, a very different uh, modality that now. So that's, that's just my couple comments. Hey, Jim, can I just ask you, so your comments um, are real important and it's not like you're a casual observer to this, just doing some quick Google, Google searches on a Saturday morning. Um, <laughs> if I recall, this is what you did your dissertation research on. Is that correct? Yes, it is. <laughs> okay. So for, I just want the public to know that those comments were, again, based on a very thorough research project. Um, you know, again, not just something over a cup of coffee on Saturday morning. So I appreciate you sharing those. Hey, Don, can I ask you to weigh on, in on this? So, and again, for the, for the public's um, sake, Don is a former teacher at Stevenson. Um, and so Don, it's especially cases like this where I'm glad you're with us. Can you, can you weigh in on this as a former teacher? Uh, is there a specific question that you want me to answer? Well, I, again, I, 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 think, I, th I think the concern is about the students. Uh, and again, if you just look at sort of, I'm, I'm gonna call it the, the arithmetic of the day here or the week. You know, the uninformed, I think, could easily conclude that, oh, my goodness, my, my, my child's not going to get a full education here. Um, I think Tom and, and Jim and others raised some really good points that, well, but we don't teach the way we used to. Where, you know, it used to all be about how many hours we spent in the classroom. And now it's not just about how many hours we spend in the classroom, but it's about then taking those maybe fewer hours and applying them um, to either learn more or confirm that we learned it. So it's different. It's difficult so. for a lot of. It's diff difficult, I think, for a lot of people who are not in the, in the business, so to speak, to really understand, you know, the true value of that or the impact of this. So I, I just think it would be helpful you as a former teacher, not part of the administration, but on the board. You know, what what are your thoughts on on the overall approach here? Um, teaching has changed quite a bit. Uh, you've heard that a few times this evening. Um, where uh, we now realize that kids need processing time. They need to be able to think about what it is that you have presented them. Um, and they also need an opportunity to talk to each other. You know, we told kids to sit down and shut up for years, and it turns out what they really needed to do was to get up and move and talk to each other. Um, and so having an opportunity uh, on those asynchronous days to allow kids to apply what it is that you've given them to discuss uh, or to do, um, that allows them to talk about it. And 
uh, I think that uh, if, if it were me, I would have set groups that had to meet on those asynchronous days and those kids would meet that wouldn't have to necessarily be during class time, but they would have to log in and show me that they have met. And there would be a body of work that they would have to get through during that asynchronous time that ties to the lesson that I had given them. Uh, I'm currently working with a group of earth science teachers to develop those kinds of lessons because like you said, Stevenson High School is, uh, they're gonna go very likely uh, to have a model similar to this where they're gonna meet with kids some days and not meet with kids. So if they go to that model, we have to develop lessons to allow those kids to have meaningful experiences from being with the teacher and then still being a meaningful experience when they're not with the teacher. Um, so uh, I did work with this group, um, not with the scheduling group, but with the teaching and learning group. Um, and the teachers have ideas. They, they have thought about this and they're continuing to think about it. Um, and no, nobody's great at it right now because nobody's had to do this yet. Um, but if you want to throw a problem at a group of people that have an idea how to solve the problem, this is the group to do it. Um, so uh, it is definitely not ideal, but I think that we have to constantly err on the side of safety. Um, you know, Kevin, you already tipped your hat a little bit about which direction you might go. I, Safety-wise, I'm looking more towards the out of school uh, that we are doing entirely e-learning. Um, I don't think that we've solved all of the problems with going to the kids in the building every day yet. Um, so uh, I look at what the, uh, the community and the teachers have said on the response um, in, to the survey. I think that uh, the hybrid model solves a lot of those problems and it, it allows the teachers and the students to get to know each other, which will be harder to do, I think, from a, um, an e-learning platform, a full e-learning platform. But uh, just in terms of, of the learning, how we're gonna go about it, the schedules that are being presented, I think solve a lot of problems. And it's not that the kids are gonna be sitting around three days a week. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't design lessons that way and neither were the teachers that I've talked to. Yeah, so Don, can I just ask one follow-up question to that? I, yeah. I, can, I can picture that exactly what you said. I guess the one other concern I might have though is that for our best students, I believe this, this can work and work very effectively. What I would be a little concerned about is for our more marginal students, is there a risk here that they could actually fall even further behind because they're not as motivated, they're not as able to master some of these changes and things like that? Well, and can I, if I could, I, I just want to add on to that very same question and get, uh, get everybody to weigh in their thoughts. I'm concerned that student-led groups have the potential to be significantly less productive when you have a classroom situation and a teacher that's supervising the interactions between the kids, they can redirect any conversations that might not be productive or motivate students who just don't know how to get started or navigate different, different personalities or opinions. Um, how do you, do we know, is there any evidence-based way to solve for letting kids do that remotely on their own? Is that yeah. question directed at me or somebody else want to take that? Yeah, I was going to, uh, to add, and I've said previously that, you know, we have excellent educators and some of them uh, do things the same way, but many of them have their own unique approaches to teaching and learning, all based on research because research supports multiple methods of doing that. So in the hybrid scenario, some teachers might choose to have the students while they're at home watch a video of the direct instruction part so that while they are in school, they can do exactly what you're talking about and work with the students present to do the group work and to collaborate together. So there are multiple ways of approaching this and I, I do trust that with the schedules and the guidance and the learning that we hope to provide that we free our teachers up for that really you know excellent experimentation and ad adaptation of their excellent in-person lessons to a virtual setting. Um, no, uh, you know, many teams will do it in a similar way, but it's hard to say we can provide multiple examples, but it's hard to say there is one best way of approaching this scenario because there are multiple ways, all of them uh, could be effective for specific groups 
of teachers, especially or for students, uh, especially our most vulnerable students, right? So um, we have talked about our most vulnerable students in the teaching and learning group as well, and how any of these scenarios presents them with unique challenges. Um, we've talked about solutions, um, and uh, there are, again, multiple solutions to those um, issues, but remote learning works very well for some students and is a challenge for others, and it's incumbent on us to discover for whom it's not working and what they need from us to support their learning. In this Rita, you have some really good points. Um, I will say I'm concerned about the lack of supervision in within remote learning groups. Um, can you address that for me? You're, you're kind of turning students, in what I'm hearing, turning students loose to learn material that in, in some cases I have confidence they'd be able to work through it. I, I have to be honest with you, I had a student that I would would have struggled with that model a lot. I have two that would have done great with it, but we have to meet the needs of all the students. And then I also am concerned, like I said, uh, about the lack of supervision in a remote learning environment if you've got unsupervised groups of kids online together. Well, I think a lot of, uh, I'm sorry, Rita, so if you want to address it. Go ahead. So Casey, I think two, I think the, your, your concerns are valid. Uh, you know, students interacting online is always something that um, high schools are concerned about. Um, and we work very hard to teach our kids the etiquette and the ways, the professional and appropriate ways to interact. It's a life skill in today's world. We are already asking students, if everything were normal in a pre-COVID era, we're already assigning students to group and, groups and assigning them to work together outside of class. Um, my own high school daughters are online every night with their friends in FaceTime groups or small groups doing homework together, talking about a presentation that they're doing together. Kids are collaborating on Google Docs and shared docs. We're a complete Google platform and the power of Google is that it allows for collaborative spaces where kids are editing each other's speeches and writing in comments to each other. They're filming each other and then um, showing each other their films and saying, please give me feedback on this. And what a well-constructed collaborative assignment does is it gives every child a unique and specific uh, uh, task and accountability. So you don't just take four kids and say, go solve two plus two, where one student does all the work and the other three socially loaf. You create assignments where a teacher can monitor the individual contributions that each student is making and where there's parameters in place that if a group gets stuck, we want them to work together to try to get unstuck. We want them to have productive struggle. But the minute that that turns into destructive struggle and they begin to fall apart or things start to happen, there is a very clear communication protocol with the teacher about that and the adult gets involved. So leaving students to collaborate for long periods of time without any adult guidance would be problematic. But over a period of a day or two with uh, immediate check-ins from a staff member, um, I don't personally anticipate that being a large scale problem. We'll certainly have individual conflicts that occur between kids sometimes, but that happens all the time um, in our regular cooperative learning. John, did you have a, you want to comment on that too, from your teacher perspective? Um, I, I've been doing it. <clears throat> I taught last semester and I assigned groups uh, commonly. Um, I, I think that they're actually way better at it than I am. They had to teach me some of the technology, but once we got the hang of it, uh, it was um, it was pretty easy and I thought it was very productive. Um, there's always gonna be problems. There's problems when you are in a regular classroom where you have issues. Uh, and so it, it requires dedicated staff that are capable of addressing those problems. It requires a community that's willing to support uh, the learning of their students um, by supporting the teachers in the process of trying to go through instruction that is far less than ideal. Um, so I, I don't think that we can address all of the problems. I, I don't think that we even know what all the problems are yet. Um, but I, 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 am, I don't want to be paralyzed by fear. So uh, we I think that it would be a good idea for us to move forward and to let our community know what it is, what our plan is going to be. Um, 
and then we'll have to continue to address those problems. Um, the community was not afraid to share the, the difficulties that they saw with what happened with, um, during the um, springtime. And we use that in helping us to design what we're doing going forward. Um, but I share all those concerns that you have, like what happened with the groups that don't work? What happens with the technology that doesn't work? What happens when you have students that are gone for two weeks because they're ill from uh, having COVID? Uh, it's all going to be very difficult and there is not going to be a perfect solution. And there's certainly not going to be a per perfect solution for everyone. If I could just say quickly, um, we are well aware of, as you said, uh, Mr. Carmichael, all of the problems that we had last spring um, many of us are parents, we're teachers, we saw um, many uh, problems with that, and we were operating, as we all know, <laughs> under different circumstances than we will be in the fall. And what we, what for me personally as a principal, the challenge that I've asked my staff and our staff, and I think what we've been asking each other on these task force are, um, if we were, you know, knowing what we know and entering this, this kind of brave new world where things change all the time, for each one of these scenarios, e-learning, hybrid, or back in school full time, what are the things that we absolutely cling to that we must ensure our students have to meet that standard of academic excellence? And what are the adaptations and the innovations we make in order to do school differently. We are forced to do school differently in two of these three models. So how can we do that in the absolute best way possible, ensuring as Rita has talked about, that our teachers who are extraordinary can develop the ground level classroom-based interventions and designs that they know will best support the learning needs of those unique students. Um, while keeping in track, like I'm so proud of our group because we haven't just thought about our freshmen or we haven't just thought about our seniors. We've been thinking about all of our students, keeping an equity lens, thinking about the kids who are on their way to Harvard, to the kids who are going to tech campus, to the kids who are going to, you know, not sure what they wanna do after school, to kids who don't have internet access 24 seven at home. That's where a full-time synchronous learning gets very challenging. Um, and so how do you meet all of those needs that a diverse community offers? Um, and I think this, these models build in a lot of safeguards to prevent um, some of the things we saw happen last spring from happening again. Okay, well, could, I, could I say there, one thing? Yeah, go right ahead, John. Uh, just to build on that, Tom, it's a great point. And I think we would be, um, you know, we would be remiss if we were just sending our teachers out into this new kind of brave new world uh, unequipped, because I think it's fair to say that we started the spring relatively unequipped. We sent them out and said, get it done uh, without too many skills, without too many tools in the toolbox. But I think it's important to know that at both schools, uh, we have plans in place to better equip our teachers to handle these kinds of uh, novel situations. So we've got half a dozen instructional coaches who are right now building a curriculum that they can then work with our teachers to implement so that these lessons do become dynamic. They do become uh, kind of two day works of art as, a, as opposed to one day of learning and a, and a second day of, you know, you're free to do what you need to do. Um, uh, we're, we're not taking that responsibility lightly. And I know that, you know, Joe O'Brien at my place, Ray Alvin at Tom's place, along with instructional coaches, are working to develop those kinds of professional learning opportunities uh, that teachers can take advantage of uh, at the beginning of the school year and throughout uh, to, to kind of improve what it is uh, that they are doing on a daily basis with their kids. The other thing that, I, that I've thought, just in terms of response uh, to Kevin's uh, mm -hmm. thoughts on this hybrid, is I think it's, it's fair to consider what we ask of our teachers. Uh, you know, I'll go to bat for our teachers every day and I know the, P I know the board members would as well. Uh, and when I think about what I would want to be asking our teachers to do, it would be this, design meaningful two-day lessons, right? And so 
they would de they would deal with a day one scenario and a day two scenario. I think what would be difficult for us to do is say, design two lessons per day for each of the cohort groups. That's doubling their work. Uh, because what they wouldn't be willing to do is, is accept that there's a group of kids that are just passively watching uh, on some streaming device, right? They would, they, would, they would feel professionally obligated to make sure that those kids were engaged and involved. And so in a sense, they're, they're double planning for that opportunity. Um, and I think, I, I, I think as I look at what we would want to ask from our teachers, I'm not sure that that's uh, kind of the, the, the best resource uh, push for us to, to, to go after. Yeah, can we go to the next slide? Yeah, I just wanted to add one final thought too that, um, you know, we, we have heard from many teachers through this process of planning in the work group, um, many with really excellent ideas about how things can be approached in 2021 um, as uh, we do things a little bit differently. Um, and a, a common refrain is, you know, we have some, the most excellent teachers in this district. Um, they need the training, as John suggested, the professional learning and the time to adapt those excellent lessons that they've designed for whatever scenario we have in 2021. So I think, you know, if, if some of you have suggested that, you know, we should lead as a district, and I think we will lead if we get this right and we provide our teachers with the support and time that they need to um, face the scenario that you ultimately choose. And I would say, Pat, before we move on, that um, we are taking the steps to be leaders in this area. And to Don's comment, we're taking the steps forward, and um, we're going to plan to be successful, uh, of you know, in this area. And we'll do what we do um, always in District 128. You know, we're we're going to enrich and enhance student learning, and we're going to build on uh, student growth and academic success. And this will be a path in this, within this pandemic that we're dealing with right now. Uh, this is a great path forward for us and our teachers will do a great job. Okay, Pat, we're gonna move, it's, uh, we're gonna move on to the next slide, okay? Yeah, yeah let's go. Thank you, uh, Rita and uh, Tom, John, Don, everybody, board members. Sorry, my last slide is, is just this, that, um, Legislation creating e-learning was originally designed for short-term emergencies like a snow day, and we have a schedule for that too, which simply is an asynchronous day where students receive their assignments in Google Classroom and work independently. If, if only the biggest of our worries was having a snow day in 2021. I will tell you on behalf of all of us, we would be, we would be happy to deal with a snow day, okay? We would be happy to have that. Uh, event happen and only have to deal with that. Or two or three. Yeah, for sure. Well, if they do occur, we're ready for them. Okay, hey, go ahead. Uh, we're moving on to uh, kind of a recap of what another one of our groups um, was tasked to do and that's consider the extracurriculars in our school. Obviously, between athletics, fine and performing arts, clubs uh, and activities, there are a lot of powerful things that our kids are involved with outside of the classroom. So uh, athletic directors, student activity directors, um, fine and performing art department supervisors, as well as teachers and students uh, participated in this group to address the driving question, how might we offer student athletics and extracurricular programs in a safe and authentic manner? So if you go to the next slide. Tom and I will just give you a quick, quick uh, update on some of these things. Let's, first, let's talk about athletics. Uh, obviously, like most of what we're talking about, there are several outside agencies who speak directly into what it is uh, that we will ultimately do in the fall. And uh, what is unique about athletics is that there is uh, a separate group, the IHSA, Illinois High School uh, Association, uh, that weighs heavily on what we do with athletics. And of course, they have uh, a correlating four-phase uh, or five-phase process, much like the governor does, 
uh, and they are in phase four now. Uh, and so most of you know that our um, phase four implementation means that we have started summer camps, sports specific summer camps. Uh, on Friday the third is when, um, you know, they came out with those guidelines and just to kind of uh, illustrate the fluidity of this, Friday the third, they came out with guidelines. It wasn't even a week later that they had changed them. And then it wasn't even a day after that, that they had changed them again. So the fluidity of some of these things uh, is really remarkable and, and handcuffs our coaches and athletic directors and activity directors uh, quite a bit. Uh, but just to touch base, we are doing those sports specific camps. Uh, they are uh, using uh, many of the safety precautions that we would plan to implement uh, in the fall between temperature checks, masks, social distancing, uh, and the like. Like I said, they shifted gears in less than a week and uh, made sure that none of the camps had any kind of physical contact, uh, no live action or contact for any of the sports. Um, it's also fair to say that they are uh, moving in a direction where they do not necessarily treat all sports the same. Uh, and we found that out pretty clearly in the guidance here this summer. So it is true that they might be looking at contact sports differently than non-contact sports. They might look at a sport like golf and say, you can have a full complete season, but a sport uh, that has significantly more contact, uh, you know, either uh, significantly changed or uh, perhaps even canceled. So uh, we don't know. Uh, Talked to Brian McDonald today. On July 22nd, the board of directors of the IHSA will convene once again uh, to try to establish some greater, more specific guidelines for the start of uh, the fall seasons. Uh, just so you know, they are looking at several different types of modifications, including perhaps changing the length of athletic season, uh, how they implement social distancing, what they do with personal protection equipment, how they deal with uh, the roles and responsibilities of officials in a coaching and coaches, uh, as well as just rule adjustments in general. Uh, so like I said, I, I think it's fair to say that we are waiting uh, on this one to see exactly what it is that our athletes are allowed to do uh, in August. There has been some rumor that the IHA is IHSA would consider flipping seasons and moving some seasons to the spring that are traditionally in the fall or vice versa. Uh, and just talking to our athletic directors who are in close contact with the IHSA, that's, that's something that is kind of a last resort and probably uh, you know, too close to the starts of seasons to be even considering those kinds of things. Um, that's probably as much as we want to move uh, forward with tonight in terms of athletics. Uh, Tom, you want to talk about activities and fine arts? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think what the board uh, needs to know is that no matter what model we're in, um, we are absolutely committed to doing and delivering our fine arts program and our extracurricular clubs to every extent that we can. Um, so. The, in terms of fine arts, uh, all of our during the day curricular programs are being offered. Nothing has been canceled or um, eliminated. So band, orchestra, choir, theater, uh, dance, all of, the, uh, all of the visual arts classes, um, they, if we are on site and having uh, school in a hybrid or back to school, uh, they will be running. If we are in e-learning, they will be running as well. Um, our staff has been researching. Each art is different and has different needs and requirements. And so the staff has been spending the summer researching all of the adaptations for their programs. And um, our goal, as with everything else, is to meet both um, the highest levels of instructional excellence to continue to develop our students' skills in the arts while um, adapting the performance components that kids are used to and um, that they love to engage in. So we may not be able to deliver performances quite the same way, but we believe that uh, we have some options for that and we believe that we're gonna continue to build our students' skills um, 
uh, no matter which of the three scenarios we find ourselves in. In terms of extracurricular clubs, uh, you know, if we're in e-school, many of our clubs last spring continued to meet. Uh, if we are in e-school, we anticipate that they would continue to meet um, in an e-school setting. If we're back on campus, we will offer our clubs um, and they would just operate according to the state guidelines of all fine arts and clubs operate with less, less than 50 students in a space. But I think it's important for you to know that we don't have any plans right now to cancel or eliminate any clubs or fine arts unless it's just absolutely impossible to run because it requires more than 50 kids or it requires a great deal of physical contact. So, so Tom, can I ask a question on that? I, I, I'm trying to gauge for myself whether that's an aspirational goal or realistic goal. For example, choir. Um, we've all read in the news about the risk of, say, a church choir and, and the spread of COVID. So how do we really think we can address something like that? Uh, we're exploring all options. And um, our music department has been engaged in very specific uh, kind of research around music departments around the country and perhaps even uh, the world. I don't want to speak for all of their research. But uh, one initial idea that was discussed was if we do uh, create outdoor spaces like the outdoor tents, we could theoretically move our choir to an outdoor uh, tent environment where they're able to socially distance, they're able to be outside um, and have space between them. We also have considered what alternative spaces indoors we could use and how we would use um, our schedule and have to adjust our schedule to move our choirs into spaces such as that. It is a challenge though, Pat, um, and presents some significant constraints on us. Yeah, and I, think, and I think, Pat, and I think, you know, this is one of those areas that's kind of a brave new world, but we're, we'll work to figure that out. If that means we have to break the groups down um, a bit from time to time. If that means we have to look at alternative settings to be able to do that, uh, then that's what we'll do. Uh, and we'll move down that path and maybe move from what you've said is aspirational to what's possible uh, yeah. to what we can actually do. And, and that's what we do here. So. And I, and I know we'll do a great job, but I, I do think there's probably some of those programs that might be at high, obviously higher risk than others. Um, because social distancing, let's say, for a choir might be significantly more than six feet, for example. So you also, have the, you also have the mask issue. I mean, you know, it's for band, you know, you can't play most of those instruments if your mouth yeah. is covered. Yeah, right. And, and th this whole area is one of my biggest concerns. And I know we can't, we can't answer it right now, but I mean, our fine arts programs are just so fantastic. And the kids just put so much wonderful effort into those programs. I mean, my heart goes out to all of them if we, if we can't deliver this, but I, I think we have to accept that there's probably some reasonable risk here with respect to what we're gonna be able to deliver, I think. Uh, well, Pat, can I just jump in? I, I yeah, know absolutely. anecdotally, there's, um, the, there's several professional organizations that, that I'm aware of for choir directors, for band directors, that have come out with some rather extensive guidelines for how you might want to approach a choir in a in a high school setting okay. and how you might want to rehearse that and whatnot they've they've done some really pretty good work i was pretty amazed at some of the the, the recommendations and how they you know creatively came up with ways to continue those programs and i agree with you i i'm a, a huge fan of our fine arts programs or fine and performing arts programs at both schools and uh we want to do everything we can to help those move forward but Yes, we have to do it in a safe manner and can't put those kids at any greater risk than anybody else in any other classroom. For sure. That's right. also one reason, you know, you may want to consider a hybrid is it may be easier to offer these types of programs um, in a hybrid model than in a full model, right? Um, not, I can't speak to all the specific health and safety requirements, but again, if it goes back to social distancing, that is the advantage of the hybrid is that we have more control over the social distancing and more options with it. Yeah. Okay. Good job, you guys. Okay. All right. What's next? All right. We're going to transition to uh, the health and safety work group, kind of the driving question across the opening options. So I'm going to turn it over to Dan Stanley. Dan. 
Thank you. Um, so um, our driving question in the health and safety work group is how might we mitigate the risk of transmission of COVID-19 in the blended and the in-person scenarios? So uh, that's an important question because um, what the health and safety group is not really fleshing out is how do you mitigate the risk of transmission uh, when you're fully remote? Uh, and that's because I think it should be pretty obvious that the, the, of the scenarios, the best way to reduce, to mitigate the risk of transmission is by not bringing people in, right? I think that should be obvious and I think we know that. Um, we are, this group was charged and is really exploring if we are bringing people in, how might we do that to help mitigate the risk, right? So uh, the other thing that I'd say is the things on the following slides are not perfect. Some of them may beg more questions. Um, and so, but we're happy to explore them. And so uh, here we go. I'm, but I'm very, very thankful for all of the participants in the health and safety work group. Um, if any of them are listening, please know your, your input is very, very valuable and was really helpful uh, to me as well going through this. So. Um, so our considerations, so just from a high level view, uh, ours are based on guidance that comes from the CDC, the Illinois Department of Public Health and the Illinois State Board of Education. So, you know, we are a state agency as a school district and we rely on um, particularly the state guidance. Um, and, you know, the state guidance is gonna, gonna be informed by CDC guidance as well, but so that it's based on that. Um, the other, the next point that I think is very important to know and to be honest about is that it is impossible to eliminate the risk of transmission, okay? Um, it, it's impossible. Um, and uh, none of these recommendations are the magic bullet, right? None of them are the perfect one solution that will magically mitigate the risk, okay? Um, our intention is that when you combine these recommendations together, that their collective impact will have a significant impact on the mitigation, right? Okay. Um, we also were working through, um, based on the guidance, what is feasible um, for us to do, what is practical for us to do, and what is acceptable, because there are a lot of people involved and um, they have to be able to go along with it. So that those are a lot of the filters that we were processing through uh, the guidelines and recommendations from CDC, IDPH, and ISB. So we're going to go through categories. So the first one is face coverings or masks, right? Uh, the simple, the simple recommendation here is that face coverings are required for all people at all times. Um, the exceptions are um, when you're outside and six feet apart. Uh, or while you're eating lunch. Um, but even this, you know, as I'm reading this, realizing there's also an exception for band, right? So it's not, this is not a perfect list, but the idea is everyone is wearing a mask all day long, okay? There are a few exceptions to that, but that's the general idea. Um, that said, we know that there are exceptions um, because not everybody is able to wear a mask for medical reasons. Um, so, uh, we acknowledge that and, you know, we know that that is going to happen. Um, so there will be valid reasons for people to not be able to wear masks. Important for the mask is it has to cover your nose and your mouth. It's not a chin cover. As you may see, uh, it needs to cover your, your mouth, your nose, and uh, no, not a lot of air escaping outside. Um, face shields. Face shields has been interesting. Uh, originally, as we said, face shields are a fine substitute for face coverings. They have since come back and revised that and to say um, it is not an acceptable uh, substitute for face coverings like masks um, because it is not effective to prevent the transmission. Um, so ISBE's guidance has been uh, you can use face shields only when necessary. Um, and for the people that are choosing to wear a face shield knowing that it is not going to prevent transmission. Um, so uh, those are a few things on the face coverings. The other one that, I, that we felt was very important to share um, is that this requirement needs to be strictly enforced. There are thousands of people potentially coming into these buildings. And this is, I, I said there's not one magic thing. Uh, this is probably the most important one um, is the masks. And so this will need to be strictly enforced 
Everyone on our health and safety committee knows that. Um, our leadership knows that. Our teachers, um, a lot of them know that. And hopefully anybody that are hearing, this, this needs to be strictly enforced at, at every level of the organization. Um, so um, the next topic is social distancing. Uh, so this was, you know, we, we know what this means, but maintaining a distance of six feet from others whenever possible. Uh, this is the important phrase that those two words were uh, added in to that guidance later that really kind of befuddled a lot of us in terms of how do we comply with this? What does whenever possible actually mean? And how do we do that and keep people safe? Um, so we realize when you, if under the scenario where you bring back everybody, there will be many, many instances where it is not possible, not just hard, right? We're saying not possible uh, to keep people six feet away from each other. Um, classrooms is the most classic example. We have, call it 200 classrooms. Um, a lot of them will, it will be impossible uh, to keep a distance of six feet from everybody if there are um, a full load of students, for example. Um, so that, that's one example. We've already talked about others. The cafeteria is difficult. Passing periods uh, will not be able to be there. The buses, right? We know buses putting, if you can put 50 kids on a bus, that is not possible uh, to socially distance in that scenario. Um, and we want to be honest about that and really forthright and let you know, like where we see it's possible and not. Under the hybrid or blended scenario, um, there are few, few, few is maybe a right word, fewer is yeah. a, definitely a correct phrase too, in terms of instances where it is not possible. So under the scenario of the hybrid that they talked about, where half of the students would be in, it is our belief that uh, almost every classroom we would be able to accomplish a six feet distance. Um, and in many of our spaces, we would be able to accomplish that as well. Um, so that's, that's the deal with social distancing. Can I ask a quick question about buses and uh, passing periods? Mm -hmm. How likely is it that mask wearing will be able to be enforced? Uh, how likely is it that it will be able to be enforced? I think on a bus, on a bus. it will. On a bus, I think it will be difficult because uh, we really need the bus driver to focus on getting the students to school or home safely, and so we want their eyes on the road. Um, so I think I, I don't think it will be the easiest to enforce. Um, regardless, that's the expectation we have to hold. Um, because I, the other side is, you know, there, there are competing interests here, right? And so there's a realistic component that I don't know that we can put a person on every single bus to help enforce that. Um, but uh, definitely the passing periods, it will, it will be an effort to help them do that. But similar to the classrooms too, like this, this, this will be a difficult thing in every, I think in every area of the school district, classrooms, passing periods, everywhere where students will be in. Because I mean, if you think about it for the, you know, a seven, eight hour day, wearing a mask is very difficult. I don't know if any of us have tried or anybody listening, if you've tried to wear a mask for seven hours, it is extremely difficult. And so uh, we just, we recognize that. However, the guidance and the, the when, I, when we say guidance, that's not like a, you know, think about doing this, it, it is a directive. Everyone needs to be wearing masks the whole time. And if I, what does if enforcement I add, look yeah. like? Go ahead, Don. What does enforcement look like? What does enforcement look like? It will. Yeah, like we're going to strictly enforce it. What does yeah. it mean if kids take their masks off? What happens? Well, Don, we'll work it through a process. I mean, ultimately, we will redefine the student handbook, but taking off your mask. Uh, not having your mask, walking around the building without your mask is, uh, you know, it's an act of insubordination. And so we'll work with, uh, for example, the Dean's LST, we'll work with a student, we'll also work with the student's family. Uh, Lisa asked, this actually tails into what I was going to say anyway. So uh, Lisa asked, has uh, raised this question before, and my response to her is that uh, we will strictly enforce it. And so we'll use all the tools in the toolbox to do that. But ultimately, if a student that is not a medical exception refuses to wear a mask, they can't return to campus because that is the guidance. And Dan is right. When the state gives us guidance, that's not we may, that, that, that is we will. We must 
uh, follow that guidance moving forward. So the other part of working with uh, high school kids is for Tom and John and their teams to build some um, goodwill around the importance of doing that and the connection to the big picture. Um, our kids are generally very adaptive here uh, in large part because uh, our staff has developed great relationships with them. Our two principals have great relationships with them. So build, to build on that importance of them wearing masks, okay, takes that in a different context than if you don't wear your mask, okay, here's how you're gonna get it stuck to you moving forward. And then the exceptional cases are the ones that will work with the student and the parent with the understanding, if you refuse to do that, you may not return to school. You're not gonna be able to come back in their building. You're not gonna be with your peers and we're gonna to have to look at an alternative for you. So it's really a two prong approach. One, leveraging relationships, building the argument around that, uh, developing um, you know, a good affect with that and then making sure that we're following through with students that um, you know, uh, take off their mask or they refuse to wear their mask um, because at the end of the day, they have to have their mask unless they're medically accepted. Um, they have to have their mask on or they can't be in school. And if, and if I can go back to the example that, that Dr. Lee had shared about the liability insurance and how um, yep. the threshold for districts um, to get to be likely in judgment on a legal case would be wanton and reckless disregard. That, so that would mean we would have to recklessly disregard the rule. So basically when ISB says, as they have said, everyone wear masks and we said, nope, we're not wearing masks. We have now, I think that is a very, very likely case that you can, you can argue that that is, we have, we have recklessly disregarded um, the public health directives. And that is just not a position that I, I am interested in putting the district in. So. And would the students and staff be responsible for having their own mask with them each day that belong to them? Would, I mean, we probably have extras or, you know, just logistically, how would that work? We're gonna talk question. about that in the coming slide, Karen. It's coming up. Uh, I don't know if I have a slide on that. Um, Under PPE, right? Uh, no, I, I don't think I have a slide that directs, it affects okay, that. So, so let's, then Dan, sure. let's talk about that. <laughs> yep. Um, so uh, we recognize a lot of people probably have masks already, um, but also we are providing, so ISB has stepped in and, and, a, and has provided a mask um, to every staff and student. Uh, in the district. Um, so I told them we have a million students. So we're looking forward to those. I'm kidding. I've told that joke too many times. I apologize if this is not the first time you've heard it. Uh, no. So we've done that. We have ordered um, two reusable masks for every staff person that will get here, I think this week. Um, we have ordered many disposable masks uh, to kind of fill in those gaps. You know, if you forget your mask or it breaks, or perhaps you have an inappropriate mask on, um, and then uh, we have a lot of um, uh, um, a lot of interest, um, and we've had discussions about um, other organizations kind of stepping in to help, whether it's um, some type of uh, parent or, or community organization to help provide more things. So, you know, for example, um, a lot of times in high schools, you have a lot of t-shirts for things. Uh, my sense is you might end up having a lot of masks this year for things. Um, so, so we've got those. So you're talking three usable masks for every staff person um, to begin with. And then we've also ordered a face shield for everyone, um, even knowing uh, the, the kind of carefulness around that, but that is still something that we have that we have that we that we're providing as well. Um, even for the kids? For the nope, just staff? The no. I'm sorry, the staff. I'm sorry if okay. I misspoke. Okay. That is for the staff. Uh, right now, the only plan that we have for students specifically is the mask provided from ISBE and we have disposables available as, um, mm -hmm. as fill in the gaps. So really a, a, uh, the mask every day would be essentially uh, a, re a, a request that, that students provide this on their own, Tim similar to other clothing they may need to provide it. We, and we recognize that there, there will be many students that we will need to help, it, help with this 
and uh, we, are, we are ready to do so. Hey, Dan, can I ask a quick question uh, before we get off of masks? Um, masks are non-negotiable. If somebody wants to wear a face shield in addition to the mask for whatever reason, nothing would prevent them from doing that, but the mask part is not optional. Correct. That's correct? Correct. That's correct, Lisa. Yeah, we, we, were, um, we were originally told it could be a substitute and then they changed. Uh, if they change again, I'll let you know. Um, uh, yeah, truly. I mean, they, they did change pretty quickly and that was a surprise. Uh, so. But if somebody wants to wear a face shield over their mask, that's an option available to them. Correct. Okay, uh, on to room capacity, which is our current slide. Uh, so this is, again, we've, we've heard this number, no more than 50 people in one room um, at a time. Um, we are eagerly, eagerly awaiting further guidance if we can further divide large spaces uh, because that will be critical in order for us to accomplish all the things we're looking to accomplish safely. Uh, um, so under the full in-person scenario, for example, that we've talked about, lunch seating is extremely difficult. You've heard uh, both buildings talk about their numbers and the spaces that we would require. Under the hybrid, um, the seating is less challenging. I don't want to say it is, it is not challenging. It will be more challenging, but it, we've, we, we find it, it's a far more simpler solution uh, to be able to do that. So that's room capacity. Screening. Uh, so this is a part of, of like taking uh, symptom checks and temperature checks. So there's really three categories. Um, and the goal for the screening is to reduce symptomatic, is to mitigate symptomatic people from getting into the building, okay? Um, with under any scenario, you're talking 8,000 or 2,000 people coming into these buildings. Um, that's very difficult to do. Uh, and we strongly feel the best way to not let them into the building is to have them not leave the house first. So um, we are we are recommending a at-home uh, checklist uh, screener uh, for people to do, um, uh, to check their temperature, go through um, a, a checklist before they leave the house. Um, regardless of that, um, there would be a temperature check at the building entrance. Uh, so everybody would get temperature checked coming in. Um, our intention is to utilize uh, some mass screener technology that we've We've fleshed out a lot. And so there's a really, really great product solution out there that we think will help us mass screen the thousand of kids, even on a, even on a hybrid plan, right? The thousand people that are gonna come into the building potentially uh, be able to do that in a timely manner. Because for example, if you just try to do the math and say, if you're gonna do something that takes three seconds a person, multiply that by 2000 people, you're gonna be doing that for a very long time, just getting people into the building. And so our, you know, we wanna limit congregating people congregating into spaces and so bottlenecking at the door entrance is just not something that is going to be um, an effective means of mitigating the risk of transmission. So at the building entrance temperature checks um, and then in building uh, having random checks throughout the day. Those are uh, the details of the, the details of some of these are a little bit TBA, TBD uh, in terms of some of those but the idea is and we recognize right again let's go back none of these are the magic thing that will save everybody, right? Um, this is another layer, another step in that. Um, and we recognize people can, if they want to, mask their temperature, right? We know there, there are ways around these if people really want to. And so that's why uh, random checks throughout the day is another step because in theory, you're, you're in the school throughout the day, perhaps if you have a medication that's been masking a temperature that could wear off, you could have a random check that might be able to help um, again, just try to help identify and mitigate um, symptomatic people from being in the building. Classrooms. Um, this is an important area in our buildings. Um, and so we are in some ways taking a bit of a step back, right? Uh, in turn, we've spent a lot of money and a lot of time getting flexible furniture to do really, really great things um, for our students. Uh, however, um, we need to take a step back in that area 
Um, and the desks need to be arranged to face one direction. Um, this, the seating um, is going to need to be assigned, um, which will help uh, with potential contract tracing that we may, we may need to do in terms of being able to identify um, and under which scenario. So if you have everybody back in a classroom where it's not possible to uh, social distance, you can have instances of close contact, which I'll talk about in a later slide. And so assigned seating, it will be a, an important component. Um, cleaning the spaces during the day will be important. And so frequently used spaces like, like the desks, the places where the teachers are, because you know, this is not an elementary school where you have the teacher stays in one room and you know, the, with the same kids all day long, like we have people rotating, students rotating, all that kind of stuff. So um, cleaning throughout the day is an important component of that. Um, when the students get released from their classrooms into the hall for the passing period, um, we don't want to bottleneck at that door to keep the students in that space and kind of stuck together. And so we're recommending that uh, the teachers kind of stagger the release of them in out into the hallway. So, you know, maybe it's a third at a time so that there's just a, a, a not a clog at the door when they're trying to get out. And we recognize that passing periods um, are a difficult thing, um, but one of the areas we can control to help that is to slow the flow of students getting into the hallway um, and trying to help them in the passing period to get to their next room uh, as quickly and efficiently as possible. So, um, and then the, the other point um, on the, the classrooms was, is we are, we are making sure that there's a hands-free hand sanitizer dispenser in each classroom. Uh, but we want to be very clear that that is not a substitute for hand washing. Um, and so, you know, we, we believe in providing this, but also makes me a little bit nervous from the health and safety perspective that this will have uh, people not uh, washing their hands um, or thinking that they, they can do this in lieu of washing their hands. Washing their hands will be an important uh, component as well. So those were some of the bigger points in terms of classrooms. All right, Dan, it's Kevin, before you move on from classrooms. Hi, Kevin. Hey, so uh, first, can you kind of cleaning space during the day? I've heard, and this isn't from our school, but I've heard some schools are having the kids, when they walk in the classroom, wipe down the desk. When they're done with class, wipe down the desk. When the next kid walks in after them, wipe down the desk. Uh, teacher yells, wipe down the desk. I mean, so, you know, there's some extremes. What are we envisioning for cleaning the space during the day? It's a good question. Um, we've talked about that a bit in our health and safety group. Um, there, uh, I would say where the group settled was uh, recognizing, by the way, so, and, and even this reminds me of Casey's point that she brought up uh, way earlier in the, in the, in the night about uh, the A and B students. Um, the classrooms are cleaned every night. So there, there wouldn't be, you know, the group, a group of students in there and then that room doesn't get cleaned. Like the, every classroom gets cleaned every night. Um, but during the day, um, that's, that's, so it comes from the, the recommendation of frequently cleaning commonly used services. So uh, at this point, what the health and safety uh, group has envisioned is that at some point in the day, um, maybe about midday at minimum, uh, we would make sure that all the desks get wiped down. And so um, all the nuances of that detail, those details we've not figured out. However, um, students can participate in that. Um, but the way that students can participate is if they're cleaning up their own mess. You know what I mean? Like they, they need to wipe up their space. We can't really be having students necessarily cleaning up other people's messes in that regard. Um, so uh, so there, there are still, I would say, some details to flesh out from there. Um, what, I, what I would say we have not seen as a recommendation is that everyone is wiping it down all the time um, because we recognize um, from the guidance that the risk of transmission on physical services, especially when wearing masks, is lower. Um, so we're trying to weigh that, that, that medical sense along, along with that. But there will... Uh, we will need to provide um, cleaning materials for the classrooms for sure. Okay. And Dan, and Dan, much like Lisa's comment on face shields, though, if I wanted my kid to carry a box of disinfecting wipes in his uh, 
backpack so that he could wipe down his desk and every period before he sat in it, that would be fine too, right? Absolutely. If they can get wipes, let me know. I'd love to know where you can find them. Yeah. Uh, no, I know. But yeah. Okay. So, hey, it's Kevin still. So now this refers back to, it's not necessarily for Dan, it's probably back to Tom, John, or Rita per se, but we talked about how our kids learn differently. You, the board paid a lot of money for furniture, clearly. We're not going to be able to use that furniture now in the schools. But we still, one of the counter arguments to me was, well, kids learn differently. I read this and say, well, you know what? Seems to me the seating is going to prevent the kids from learning differently. So, again, are we, I know the two groups communicated. Did you guys as a curriculum group have an issue? And not, you know, you can't override safety, of course, but. Doesn't this impact the way the kids get taught? Rita, Tom, John, one of you. Before they unmute, I would say absolutely it will. Like we, we, we know it will, I guess, to the extent they could talk, but. Well, and I guess I can also refer to Dr. Batson because he could talk about, was this in the dissertation about classrooms and learning and things like that? You know, so again, it, it all comes back to full circle. We have to adjust. We have to adjust the classrooms by safety standards. So we're gonna to have to adjust the way we teach as well. So again, anybody can try to help me understand this. I wanna point out that we still will be able to use that furniture. It was purchased to be flexible furniture. So one of the flexibilities is that you can move it into rows. Uh, you can also put them into groups. Um, but the idea was so that they could you could have lots of different arrangements. So I'm, I'm we assuming, Dan, groups. we are still going to use that furniture. Yeah, but we can't have groups within six feet. So we're not going to be group learning Correct. anymore, per se. So we know that. So again, one of the arguments made earlier clearly was kids, <laughs> hey, kids learn differently. This is the way, Don, you learned. This is the way I learned. And so again, help me get over that block. This is, this is reverting me back to my argument. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that we've necessarily concluded though we can't still do some group work because let's uh, let's imagine we're in a hybrid model we have half as many people in the building um although i guess we have you, um, you we, cannot we, have do half, we have half as many people in a classroom i mean i think there's you, there clearly should be some scenarios at least in some circumstances where we can socially distance with a mask on and still do group work i, I think. cannot do a lab in a group i cannot be six feet from my lab partner it's impossible if, if my I, well if, now, if by the lab I mean, now, you, um, now you've only got half as many people in the lab at any one time, though. Yeah, but again, some help me understand if they're facing forward, that's what this says, and it's assigned, which is fine, how we are not, how we're going to be able to teach differently. I would say that um, we uh, taught differently before the furniture was purchased, that um, although we have rooms currently where desks are arranged to face in one direction as the regulations require, there are ways to have students collaborate with one another um, by turning and talking to the person in the desk that is next to, you know, you partner up people who are in adjacent rows, you have students stand and move to different parts of the room. Um, this, the guidance that the desks are arranged in one direction doesn't preclude students from being able to converse with one another as you are trying to maintain six feet of distance. Um, and, and again, that furniture is going to make it much easier and much more effective to expediently form groups and collaborate and um, join in partnerships. Uh, but those kinds of partnerships occurred when desks were arranged in rows and facing one direction and they will continue to occur under this guidance. I'll just toss in a, a couple comments, and my research had nothing to do with furniture or classroom settings, uh, but uh, you actually brought it. pandemics for that matter. <laughs> or <laughs> pandemics for that fact of the matter. Exactly. But, but, but Kevin, you mentioned the, the, the lab classroom, and, and what I would say is, is one of the things that I know, and much of this new, you know, a, a new classroom configuration, uh, we've removed that large, immovable monster of a lab table out of the out of the lab setting now so it's a much more flexible environment in the classroom so to that point we're not stuck with the these large lab tables that have specific seating in specific locations you have more movable furniture so in many ways 
uh, to, to Don's point, a new, more flexible furniture arrangement could actually provide more opportunities to rearrange the furniture in a classroom to be social distanced without having to remove cabinetry or to, to you know, get rid of uh, certain tables or things like that that, uh, that wouldn't allow for it otherwise. No, I appreciate that. I'm an accountant by trade. So if, again, I'll, I'll, I'll throw this back to Prentice or somebody. Sure. If you guys could just give me like some pictures so I can see how group learning can happen with the six foot recommended social distancing, of course. Again, this, this is learning, by the way, under the hybrid model, group learning under the hybrid model, uh, maybe in a science class and a math class uh, or any other class, just a couple of pictures. That might help me start to get over this uh, hurdle that I have. So. I just asked for that. Thanks. Sure, and we and we have a we also have a great reference point in the board because Don's a science teacher, so Don can probably help us draw that picture. I think Don. I don't mean to speak. Yeah, thanks for, you, for putting me on the spot there, Prentice. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry, <laughs> um, Kevin. I, I've given that some thought, uh, and it's not going to be easy. Um, but very often we have kids working in groups of four. Uh, and that's from a material standpoint. If you have groups of two, in many cases, that's better. Uh, and kids can talk to each other um, side to side when you're talking specifically about lab work. So if I've got kids that are uh, using a hot plate to boil uh, or to take ice from uh, minus 10 degrees up to 110 degrees, then all I need is one person at the hot plate and one person doing recording. And I'm going to get the data. I'm going to do a lab. I'm having them work as a group. Um, so it is possible for kids to do group work. It's just not going to be four kids leaning in together on a table the way they used to. And I, the, other, the other thing I would say, if I could, is it, I think for me it goes back to what I want my teachers to be focused on. What, what do I want their energies going towards? And Kevin's point is valid. Like we, we are setting them up for a new kind of redesigned um, way of, of teaching within, within their classroom. And I want their focus to be, how can I take these limitations, these, these kind of new sets of rules and create dynamic, meaningful lessons with the kids that are in that group? What I don't wanna say is, all right, now you're all just gonna lecture from the front so we can stream in the rest of the kids and everybody gets the same uh, kind of static uh, lecture from the front. What I want them to do is say, work with the instructional coaches, look at best practices and figure out how to work within the dynamics to make meaningful lessons. And um, I think they'll rise to that occasion. Our teachers are awesome because, because they know uh, how to motivate kids, they know how to work with kids, they know how to create meaningful lessons, and that's what I want their focus to be. Tom, I don't know, you look like you have a thought, Tom, so let, let me see if I read your mind here. Uh, there's, this also opens the door, or it opens the door more to develop uh, the group work outside the class as well, right? So we spent a good part of the uh, earlier evening talking about what that might look like. Some experiences, let's say Don has had, other teachers have had in terms of doing that, but it allows us an opportunity to use that different forum to also, you know, um, uh, take that group learning piece a step forward outside the classroom or in the, you know, the asynchronous day when kids are not in the classroom. I probably didn't get your thought, Tom, so go ahead. Actually, you're much deeper than I was. I was just laughing because for the last couple of years, we've uh, actually been working to, um, to not have the front of the classroom. We've kind of created classrooms with no, no, you don't know where the front is. So in terms of the state guidelines, that's another challenge for us to implement when they say, have all your desks face the front of the classroom, because we've kind of eliminated that from many of our rooms. So it's just me just laughing at the situation we're in, finding some humor in it as <laughs> we try to decode all of this stuff. Okay, Dan, what else uh, is on your deck there? We should be at symptoms at home, right, Mr. Stanley, or no? Only I had the next slide. Uh, symptoms at home. So uh, this is uh, for this is so we're, for people that are at home. When you're at home and you recognize that you have symptoms, uh, don't come to the building. Don't try to enter the building. Uh, and so this is very very straight from uh, the organizations: is uh, don't enter until 72 hours from the resolution of a fever without fever reducing medications. 
uh, and 10 days from when the symptoms first appeared. Uh, so that's pretty clear. Uh, there's not really uh, when possibles around this language in their, in their guidance. Um, so that's when you're at home. Uh, the next one is if you are in the building. Hey, Dan, and don't move on. It's Kevin again. Sorry. This goes back to, I think, a, a question. Go back to the previous one if you could for me. So we're going to have kids potentially 10 days at home when symptoms first appear. Back to the learning group. I didn't hear us talk about the kids who are quarantined, these kids 10 days at home and things like that. Are we going to talk about that later? Because I think we... I didn't see that addressed in the, let's just talk, I, I guess, in any type of, well, it's really only in the full, full time schedule, or I guess on the hybrid, well, hybrid, they'll be okay, but. I think that's coming in a, in a couple slides, right? Okay. Yeah. Distance learning. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, then if you are in the building and you discover or somebody else discovers that you have symptoms, uh, the, the, the very important component of this is to remove that person, whoever they are, uh, from the population. So remove them from the school population, remove them from the classroom, remove them from the hallway, remove them, um, and try to get them out of the building as reasonable as possible. Send them home or, you know, if they need to, maybe if they need to go to the hospital or something. Um, and then uh, that area that, uh, that was used needs to be closed and not open again until it's been cleaned and disinfected. Um, we, so that, not saying that is easy, um, but um, that is that is the guidance straight from IDPH and ISB on that. And by yeah. symptoms, do you mean if somebody has a fever in the middle of the day, or is it if somebody's coughing? I mean, does it, it they could give you be, any guidance um, on that? If yeah, it could be. You know. There are there are several symptoms uh, that could present themselves, and so one of our one of our jobs that I'll talk to you in a in a second here is is uh, informing people of those symptoms and uh, helping them be more aware. Um, be, because th there are, fever is a, is a common one. Not everybody has a right. fever that has COVID, you know? So I don't, I don't think it's, it's going to be super easy. It's going to be tricky. And Karen, I, I will tell you one other thing that uh, we've actually talked about with the teachers and we're gonna have to talk about with the students um, as well. And that is um, a lot of us, uh, have come to work when we weren't feeling well, because that's how we kind of grew up, that work ethic, that's how we've been trained. You know, you get in there, you tough it out because that's what you do. Uh, you don't take a sick day, for example. And so part of this process is gonna be a re-education for our staff. It's gonna be a re-education for our uh, students uh, and a re-education of our parents working with the students uh, as well. So if students wake up with 100 hundred point, let's say eight temperature, that they don't tough it out and come to school that day. So again, a lot of this is going to be on the educational side in terms of raising awareness and empowering people to tell them, look, we want you to stay home. You're not being a hero by coming to school and going to work or going to your fifth period test if you've got 101 fever, right? Um, so that's part of the process. And, this, and, and just to add to that, I mean, this is an area where we really need a lot of support from the community as well, because, again, from everything I've read on that, the single biggest thing we can all do to get the schools fully open is reduce the transmission of the virus. And, you know, we, we need parents and, and the community in general reinforce wearing the masks, don't come to school if you're sick, all of those things can really help get the transmission down. Which is, an, which is an important thing and a, 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 a more difficult thing in such a high performing district. You have yeah. no, it's hard. students right. that will want to come. You have staff that are, that are extremely dedicated that want to come, you know, like yeah. I, I can't lie. I've, I've come to work sick before, right? Because yeah. like, it's so important, but we have, we have to change that mindset. Yeah, we absolutely have to change that mindset because again, the, the way we're going to fully open schools without all these restrictions is we've got to get the, the transmission of the virus way down. Okay, next. Close contact. Um, this one is just, uh, I think this is one that's going to be a bit of a confusing term for some. And so this is one we're going to have to keep talking about. Close contact is defined as being within six feet for longer than 15 minutes. 
Uh, so even when we've talked about socially distancing, for example, the passing periods, if our passing periods are under 15 minutes, then by definition, you can't have close contact in the passing period, you know? So um, close contact is even being, being an important component in terms of understanding um, who may need to, you know, quarantine or how they get impacted. Um. Okay, next, Dan. All right, here's just a few miscellaneous things. Um, visitors, it'll be important for us to, to extremely limit the people that, we wanna limit the people that are coming into the building. So we want as few people coming in as possible, especially visitors. So the visitors should be limited to only essential in-person meetings. If you can have a meeting over Zoom or something, do that. Um, we need to limit the number of people that are coming into the buildings. And so that means uh, parent limiting those as much as we can. Uh, this means limiting the things that come into the buildings. So um, dropping off food and stuff and Starbucks and DoorDash, like those things are, we're gonna have to restrict the th all the new stuff coming into the building. Um, uh, important thing for lunch is to strongly encourage people to bring your own lunch if possible. Um, the food options that we have will be prepackaged, but um, the, the more that people can bring their own lunch, that will help mitigate transmission. Um, bring your own water if possible. We, we will have our fountains open. We, we would need to have those available, um, but we want to encourage people to bring their own water, bring your own water bottle uh, so that you can hopefully uh, contain that just to yourself. Uh, physical barriers at the reception desk. So you can think like sneeze guards, those clear barriers at a lot of reception desks and there's other areas we're looking at. Um, passing periods, having guides on the floor, like little like lines or guides to kind of know, to kind of keep people spaced out a bit and stuff like that to help them to know which way to go. Um, frequently washing the hands for at least 20 seconds is a very important thing that we need to keep uh, recommending to people and keep reminding them. And finally, um, we need a very strong system of proactive, direct, and frequent communication about all of these things. How to wear a mask, how to identify your symptoms, how to sneeze or cough. You're gonna cough or sneeze someday in the day, sometime during the day. How do you do that as safely as possible? How do you, um, what's the proper way to keep your mask, right? It's not a chin strap. All, these, all of these things we are, we're gonna need a lot of that and signage where using whatever means that we have to keep communicating about these. Hey Dan, what, one other um, comment before we uh, transition to distance learning and Dan talked a little bit about uh, contact tracing tonight um, or mentioned it earlier. And um, as we're waiting to get uh, the specific guidance from Lake County Health Department, that will be part of the guidance that we receive from them. We know we're gonna play some initial role in that. Um, in our young person at, at Vernon Hills who was identified COVID-19, uh, we played a uh, role, an initial role uh, in the contact tracing or development there. And then uh, Lake County Health Department did a marvelous job behind that in building that out. Uh, so we need to see that guidance uh, to see what specifically our role will be in initial contacts, and then their role is going to be uh, in the broader building out of following up with all the permutations of, of the names. So that's yet to come, and we don't have that information. And when we get that, we will uh, certainly share that with the board, and we can communicate that with the public. And as a, just a reminder, in this area, we take the health of our kids and staff very seriously. And so we care deeply about them and none of these things will eliminate the risk of transmission. We're hoping the combined impact of these things will have a significant impact in reducing um, the risk of transmission, so. Okay, uh, we are on the home stretch with distance learning and human resources. Um, so uh, we've got several slides to go. So we're gonna transition to Kelly Hartwig uh, Kelly, you're still there, I hope. I'm still here. I can't you see you right the now. Ron Kelly is the best for last, though. There you go. Well, <laughs> almost. Yeah, almost the almost. best for last, right? Um, well, so tonight I know the focus is really about the reopening of school for the masses and um, knowing that we'll probably be having more conversations. I was hoping to take a few minutes of the evening to give you a beginning context. Um, for thinking about our students who won't necessarily be able to return in person, no matter what the model is that 
the masses are in at any given time. And so um, the distance learning team has been meeting uh, for weeks on end as well. Uh, we've been a small but mighty team. And um, we have really used as our driving question, how might we design distance uh, learning options for students who cannot return to in-person learning that are based on effective, nimble, and adaptive, adaptable instructional strategies? Um, I think it's important to understand distance learners are going to be different from remote e-school um, learners, all the other terms that we've talked about, okay? So um, just to give us a common language here, a common understanding, distance learning occurs or is a situation in which the learner and the instructor are separated by distance and they can't physically be together in the same space, okay? Um, so distance learning is not necessarily part of any one of the other three opening options that we've discussed tonight because distance learning will happen simultaneously and in conjunction with all of those other options that have been discussed. Okay, so tonight what I really want to focus on is who are distance learners and what could they look like. And there are really two categories of distance learners. There are more permanent ones, if you will, or what we're calling semester-based distance learners. And there are temporary ones, temporary distance learners. Um, Kevin, you mentioned them a few moments ago. So our semester-based distance learners are students who will engage in distance learning for the duration of the semester, and most likely for the full school year, or even potentially until we re-enter phase five. Um, there are many different groups or subgroups that fall under these semester-based distance learners. So I think it's important to understand that the reason that our group recommended we look at them in semesterly chunks is because a circumstance may change for a student. And when I describe these subgroups in a moment, I think that you'll have a better understanding of why that is, that we would look at this a semester at a time. Um, temporary distance learners are those ones that Kevin mentioned before. So the students who may need to be distance learners, but for a short period of time because of a medical need. So let's talk first about that larger, not larger, longer term distance learner, if you will. Um, and I really want to focus tonight on the ISBE required subgroups within those semesterly uh, distance learning um, category. So there are really three subsets under here. The first is students who have their own medical need. They have their own underlying medical condition that puts them at place of being at a higher risk of severe illness if they're exposed to the coronavirus. And these students would, require, would be required to provide medical documentation um, or if they already have an IEP or a 504 plan that provides us that documentation already, we can use that as a baseline for identifying those students. The second group would be who we've been referencing as family protectors or students who live with individuals who are at a higher risk of severe, severe illness as identified by the CDC guidance um, that you may be aware was revamped or updated, uh, I believe a week or so ago. Um, we would um, require medical documentation of that family member's underlying medical condition. We're not looking to get into the weeds of personal information, yet rather a doctor or medical provider verifying that a person in the home has this medical condition or um, high risk scenario that requires their student to be a distance learner. Um, the third group would be students who um, is be is be identified students who may have needed to have gained employment during this pandemic period. So since March 13th or 16th, in order to financially support their family. Um, and the ISBE guidance really encourages districts to have that student provide documentation that they have this employment need and the family is dependent on that income for their financial stability. Um, but also to then work with that student to find ways to set up scheduling opportunities that will allow that student to engage in learning the most that they can and to make it as accessible to them as they can. 
all three of these groups fall under the ISBE identified students who we will need to consider providing distance learning options for. Um, and again, probably on a more permanent or a longer basis. The temporary distance learners, however, are students who um, have a temporary need. And I think that before or as you look at this, um, it's important to remember that school districts have always served the needs of students who have temporarily been unable to attend school in person for a variety of reasons. And historically, we have done that. Um, if you really look at that third subset first, that first sub or the third subgroup, we've looked at these students um, when they have provided us medical certification of a need for home or hospital instruction. Um, so these are our students who have maybe been in a car accident and they are recouping at home and really cannot be at school. They may have cancer and be going through chemo treatments or they may have other impairments, health impairments that prohibit them from attending school in person um, for a short period of time. But the goal for these students is that they're coming back. Um, so other students that we need to recognize will probably increase these temporary distance learners for us and for all school districts are the two categories of students who may have been exposed at school. So we as a district or a school have identified that the student has had close contact with someone who is positive or who we believe is symptomatic. Um, and we may need that student to quarantine um, or potentially isolate. Or maybe a student finds out in their home, in their community, that they have potentially been or have been exposed to coronavirus and thus they need to implement quarantine for themselves until they know one way or the other where their health is going. Um, so we know that all of these groups, again, under the ISBE guidance, are groups that we will need to consider distance learning options for. Um, the district has always provided creative ways for addressing the needs of temporary distance learners. And um, it is very apparent in the distance learning group and in working with the teaching and learning and scheduling groups a little bit that um, the district vibe continues to be that we want to find creative opportunities for addressing the needs of all of these learners, the ones who are more permanent, if you will, or semesterly, and the ones that are temporary. Um, we also recognize that there may be groups who, um, you know, may need distance learning beyond those ISBE referred um, subsets. And so we continue to look at those groups and look at those um, potential needs and look for uh, creative ways to identify high quality distance learning options for them. This continues to be a work in progress, but I look forward to bringing more information about distance learning to you in the future, though I know you may have questions tonight. Is that our cue for questions? If you'd like. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. Um, can any student elect to be a distance learner? That is definitely a question that we are continuing to explore right now. Um, the ISB uh, guidance actually released an FAQ, you may be aware, and it has been updated periodically over the last few weeks. It was updated as recently, um, I believe it's July 9th, um, and said that that is a local decision. So that is something that we need to talk about as a district um, in these work groups and in all of the collaborative groups that are coming together to determine whether that would be an option that we feel is viable and appropriate for our community. Well, and, and also can we logistically support that with our staffing model in two buildings? Mm -hmm. um, so that is something that we will have to investigate. Uh, if you have one campus, it's easier to leverage your resources. If you have two buildings or more, it's much more challenging logistically with the kind of time that we're looking at in terms of planning. And I know this, this had to do with this, the learners, the students, but, and I don't know if you're going to get into this tonight or not, but of course, some of these things would then present questions about the staff and the teachers and what happens in some of these same scenarios or exposure and, um, you know, you, 
we think of if one student is identified, you know, our, our I guess our summer camps is what made me really think of this is one student is identified as being tested positive and everyone that they've been exposed to in this case was a very small group. Um, but if a student at school tests positive, then does every one of their instructors have to take off of school? I mean, it just, it gets into logistics. Or if, it, or if a teacher has some of these same things or someone in their family is medically fragile, what happens with them? And, and again, I'm, I'm jumping either ahead or to a different time, but I'm well, just Well, and that. that's, you know, to your point, Karen, that's, I, that's why I, I, tonight isn't necessarily the, yeah. it would be too much to hit you with all yeah. of the possible variables that could require distance learning. But as an example, and something that you just mentioned, you know, if one student uh, tests positive in a class, you may have one distance learner in that, in a hybrid scenario. But if that student has been in close contact because social distancing wasn't viable, let's say in a fully uh, returned or in a hybrid even scenario, um, you could have, depending on the way the desks are set up, eight other students in addition to that student who might need to be distance learners for a temporary period. So there are, this is one of those spider webs or you know windshields that when it cracks, it shatters in every direction in every possible way. And that's just the student side of it Luckily, the other Kelly has the staff side of it because that is also a challenge. This is one of the key things that I think is going to determine how well we can sustain whatever it is we initially start out to do as well. Absolutely. Yeah, and, the, and a lot of that initial uh, testing is even we saw last spring or a lot of the initial work on that is going to come through uh, contact tracing and working with Lake County Health Department, right? Yeah. So in Kelly's example, where there's a kid in a classroom of 25, or even a kid in a classroom of 15, uh, not only that class, but you know, was it another class and another class? So that in initial contact tracing and following uh, those leads down, working with Lake County Health Department for not only for us, every school uh, that's looking forward. And of course, the same is true with the staff, right? So. Good okay. job, Kelly. Thank you. Is that it, Kelly? That is it for me. Thank okay. you. Okay. I'll um, be back. Mr. Oh, another question. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah. I got a question. Have... Hey, Go Chris, ahead, I, can't, I can't let Kelly off the hook. It's not fair. Okay. All right. <laughs> I'm ready. I know you're I'm holding ready. me for the end, Kevin. I know. So go oh, ahead. Don't worry. You, you have no idea what I'm going to ask you, Prentice. No I idea. Know. I know. Uh, hey, Kelly, can you just with less than a minute, can you just throw out like examples of ways we can educate that kid who's gonna be quarantined for like 10 days or 14 days? And we're not holding you to anything, but I just, I just can't see how that kid, whoever that is, is not gonna fall way behind by doing the right thing. So what I can tell you are um, some things that the distance learning team has considered um, and we've, we've used this in the, or we've, we've thought about this in the framework of throwing the noodles at the wall to see what sticks, right? So we're still in the noodle throwing phase of this. Um, but we have talked about could courses or sections be offered with D128 teachers? That would be the preferable option um, by all of the staff members who've been part of that conversation. Um, you know, we've also looked at and begun vetting third party uh, vendors um, like Illinois Virtual School or EduSeer that might be, be able to provide a distance learning curriculum designed for distance learners for the student who we can't provide a section for. Um, likewise, likewise, we've asked our teachers to, and this is where my holdup is, Kevin, um, it's a good holdup because it's, it's gathering information um, but we're in that gathering information phase from our teachers of what, what do you suggest? You're the ones who've had kids who've been temporary um, distance learners in the past. So, you know, you've brought up live streaming, you know, is that a possibility? Does it, does it provide a high quality experience for the content that you're teaching? Are there alternative options that could address the core standards, but that would be better fit or better suited to a distance scenario? Now, again, um, Kelly, not, not to cut you off, because, again, we're getting late, but 
what you just said to me it sounds I, I 100% know you're going to get to the permanent guys who are going to be long term, the, the ones who probably have to be out for the year, or if the board decides those who also may choose to be out for the year. But again, that, that kid who goes to calculus is, and now come November, walks through the door, has 103 fever, you're out. <laughs> you're just out, and you might be out for 10 days. How are they going to get? You know what I mean? And, and again, I know I can't hold you to it, but I just can't see how they're going to not get crushed in that five-day or 10-day period. We don't want that either. So I promise you that is something that we are really looking heavily into to try to address. But I do want to remind you, the, the irony in this scenario is that the permanent distance learners are actually easier to address yeah. than these temporary yeah. ones because they ebb and flow and fluctuate. Um, and this is something that we have been doing through our students who have been um, home instruction eligible through the home and hospital process of ISBE for as long as that has existed. So we can do it. It's just thinking about this on a broader scale now. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. The Eller Kelly, Mr. Kelly. All right, thank you. Um, so um, I chaired the human resources work group and uh, had a couple administrators and some staff members, teachers that joined us in that group. And so our driving question in this is how might we allocate and care for our district um, personnel in all possible school scenarios? And, and I do have to say that a majority of our time, I think and efforts were spent looking at um, if we come back into a, you know, a hybrid or a full school opening. Um, but we have also talked about if the possibility of going to remote um, uh, of how to care for all of our personnel. When I say personnel, I'm, I'm talking about teachers, uh, administrators, and support staff. Um, so some of the things that we looked at, some of the strategies that, you know, we need to think about moving forward is identifying the staff members similar to the students um, that might have uh, medical um, or childcare issues and cannot work in person. So those that cannot be in the school building. Um, and so we need to be able to identify, you know, those personnel. Um, the other things is there may be some people that can come to school, but there might be some accommodations for them while they're at school um, so that they can be in a safe and healthy environment while they're teaching or or working you know, in an office or working with our students um, as a social worker, a counselor, uh, different areas around the building. So we need to look um, at all of those. And some of those too, those accommodations are things that the health and safety group has also considered to try to put into place in the buildings to ensure a health and safety environment you know, for all of our um, personnel. Um, you know, one of the other things that um, we've touched upon in the teaching and learning is that we do need to provide professional learning support in the different scenarios for our personnel. So, um, you know, if we go to a hybrid version, which is a combination of in-person um, and, and remote, you know, we need to provide that professional learning support for our teachers so that we can provide the best educational experience for our students. Um, so, you know, those are some of the strategies we looked at. Some of the others then is that we need to identify, and I think Karen alluded to this a little bit um, in her questions about, you know, personnel, is uh, any um, substitute teacher candidates um, to fill in for the staff members that, you know, just like the students, they may have to be out for 10 days if they're quarantined. Um, they may be out for a short, shorter period of time. They may be out for a longer period of time. So how are we going to um, have somebody fill in, you know, on a temporary basis in their classroom? So we looked at, we do have a pool of daily subs um, that come into the building all the time. Some of them work once a week. Some work more than others, but we have um, gone through our list. We've contacted all of our daily subs 
that work at both Libreville and Vernon Hills to see who would be available um, on a much more needed ba basis. Um, because we do have some subs that, you know, don't, they don't want to come back and, and work in the buildings. And so we need to kind of know that ahead of time and identify those subs and try to get them to make a commitment to us. Um, we've talked about um, maybe hiring some of those daily subs just every day and they would just basically show up every day and be put to work in a class every day. It might be the same classroom for a while, it might be um, you know, bouncing around every um, day. Um, you know, obviously utilizing retired teachers um, in the building. Um, you know, teachers have our, our greatest resource for teaching class. And so obviously we want our own staff in there, but if you have retired teachers, um, you know, they've been in the environment before and so they're a great resource. Um, looking at our part-time teachers in the building and they can in service on their off periods. And then also tapping into our current teachers, you know, have prep periods and lunch periods and utilizing them to fill in for staff. So we're looking at all different strategies to be able to, um, you know, basically fill in all of our classes during the day. Um, the other important thing is that, you know, we talked about and I know, you know, teaching and learning alluded to this, that any possible time we may have a possible shift in the school scenario. And so we need to be prepared to help our um, teachers, support staff and administer, administrators move to that new school scenario. So whether we're in a hybrid and we're going to a full school, school opening to a remote school opening, how can we make that and support them um, as best possible. So, uh, you know, part of, you know, we looked at a lot of strategies, we've identified areas that, you know, we can look at. We're waiting a little bit to know what our, you know, school reopening plan is so that then we can, you know, kind of move with some of these strategies to make sure that we can have all of our, you know, classes and courses um, taught this year. Um, knowing that, you know, depending on the, um, again, the school scenario that we may have some uh, teachers that due to certain reasons may not be able to be in the building, so. That's what I have. Okay, good job, uh, Brian. All right, any, is there anybody else, Prentice? Uh, no, Pat, and if it's okay, I'll, I'll try and wrap us up a little bit here. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. So first, let's acknowledge, uh, let's thank everybody that joined us virtually uh, tonight. Uh, we had a very large audience tonight, and it's almost 10 o'clock, so they've been with us for almost four hours. Um, let me also thank um, all of the um, teachers, support staff members, administrators, parents, and students who worked on the task force. Task forces, you can see. Um, the level of work those groups did. Uh, several of our board members are sitting on uh, uh, um, some of those task forces. Uh, they've made similar comments, but they've really done incredible work. And just to give you context, we got the revised part three, phase four, part three guidance on June 4th. All right, we had webinars the next two days before anybody could implement. So somebody could try and explain uh, it uh, to us. And then we started going to work. So really in, in a little over a month, um, these uh, eight work groups have done terrific work uh, and spent a lot of time and we're very appreciative for, for all of them. So um, one more thing before I um, kind of uh, wrap us up on scenarios real quickly. And I also want the community to understand that as we go through the collective bargaining process here, what we are doing with the union as partners is we're working on collective bargaining, the impact bargaining for each one of these scenarios. And the reason we're doing that, Bryant just hit on again, and I commented on earlier, that we know there's a high possibility that we could be in two, if not all three of these uh, options over the course of the school year. So we wanna work through that collective bargaining process, the impact bargaining process, and be ready to go and be able to pivot if and when we have to pivot for a short time 
uh, or a long time. And I want the community to know that uh, the board is a part, uh, the union is a partner in that process. And uh, they're working uh, with us as partners in that process. So uh, we're working together. So uh, the last screen uh, again, or last slide, just uh, reviews the options, which we talked about you know, quite a bit tonight. Uh, and in some detail and some of the impacts um, of those things. And I would just highlight again that we really care about our kids. We really care about our staff members. Uh, and we want to give them the best pos possible education uh, and high school experience, but to the best of our ability, keep them safe. And the one thing we're struggling with right now is uh, the concept of social distancing uh, that's very different than, you know, kind of what we were all raised on over the last uh, few months and our ability to less effectively um, social distance kids, as Dan highlighted, um, in um, an option where we have all the kids in, in the building and all the staff at the same time. So, uh, but we want to um, make sure that the board has all the tools in the toolbox so as they evaluate these options, uh, they're best able to make a, um, you know, the best decision that we can, uh, given the dynamics that we have uh, when we have it. And uh, just assure the public that that's exactly what we'll do. Uh, and we'll try and do that in the best interest of our kids and our staff, for sure. Okay, okay. is that it? Friends? Yeah, Pat. So, all right. I, here's, yeah, go ahead. Pat, there's here's the test for the board at the end of the evening. Okay, and that is what are the what are the two new words in our vocabulary that started the presentation tonight? Adaptability and flexibility. Okay, you got it. Okay, there you go. Okay, Pat, turning okay. it over to you. All right. So uh, again, I want to echo my thanks to everybody that participated in putting that uh, all that hard work together. And I know there's just a lot of hard work behind the scenes. Um, I did start this by saying I would like to get some sense from the board where everybody stands on these various options. We don't have a lot of time to go into it in great detail tonight. Um, but I guess I would ask, would anybody want to comment on any of the three options from the standpoint of this is an option I just don't feel like I can live with? Um, I would be curious whether there's any consensus on, on that at this point. I'd be willing to start off with okay. saying that our first option with um, full in-person learning uh, is the one that I am the least comfortable with. Okay. Um, I think I represent many people that answered the survey really gung-ho about in-person learning. And then things continued to evolve. Okay. And I think... Um, what, I, what I've heard from several friends and neighbors and community members is the, the way that they answer that survey is not, not does not, uh, no longer represents the way that they feel. And, and I, I am one of those people. Um, okay. I think bringing people in full time with adaptations, uh, that first scenario is uh, probably ill-advised. As okay. much as it's what I think I wanted, it's, 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 it's what I still want. But I don't see how we do that and keep our teachers and our students and our staff safe. So okay. that's where uh, I am. So good comments. And, and that's really just the kind of feedback I'm trying to get to here. Um, is there any other feedback, anybody that feels strongly that um, scenario number one is, is the option we really still need to strongly consider at this point? And again, we're not, we're not holding anybody to this. It is a very fluid situation. Um, but I have to admit that we're within a couple of weeks at most for making this decision. And, and I have to question how much new data there's going to be, quite frankly. Um, but I, I would like to hear from anybody who says, no, 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 I think we need to hold out for option number one. No, so, this is Kevin. Yeah, I'm, I'm obviously going to be holding out for option number one. Uh, you know, and again, I appreciate the opening comments that were made to premise by the teachers who are scared for their their health, I, I wholeheartedly support them. Many of you know I'm a cancer survivor from 2014. I had the worst type of cancer. I'm God willing, I'm here. But I am willing to do what's in the best interest of my kids for their social and educational experiences. And to me, that is going back full time, 
for as long as we can. And again, this is understanding, and I hope everybody knows this, that we will definitely be going to all three models. So just because I'm supporting full-time right now doesn't mean I don't support the other two models, because I certainly, again, we'll talk about some twe tweaks later on, but we will be going all three ways. But I think we have this opportunity right now to go full-time. I believe we'll have the opportunity in the spring to potentially go back full-time. And I think we should take that opportunity and 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 be and take that calculated risk. So okay, all right. Thanks. Anybody else want to comment on option number one? Just I just want to comment, and as it pertains to to that one and others, that the I mean, as, as I'm sure you're all aware, the population group that the cases are rising right now in the last couple of weeks in Illinois are from the 30 and under. So the young people are where the popul the cases. Are rising in our state and um, I think that has I don't think we've talked about that tonight but I think that has to inform yeah. um, bringing people together in such close proximity. Okay all right on the other extreme uh, and I think this is probably where we'll end the conversation tonight is there anyone that feels that the full virtual option strongly feels that that's the way we need to be going here? Pat, let me, uh, I'll just jump in here. And, and first of all, I'm going to answer it. My honest answer is not any of the above. It's we have a great group of professional teachers and administrators that are tuned in with what the, what ISB, what IDPH, what all these, these groups are, are, uh, are talking about. And from my perspective, if you had to ask me what what option I would say whatever the administration would recommend because they know best about our district. That being said, um, I think my personal option would be uh, to, to start the year in a remote learning scenario just to get us going in the most safe and take the health risk out of the scenario and get us moving in the right direction, get us reseeded into a, a much different remote learning opportunity and, um, you know, and adjust from there, whether it's moving into a hybrid or maybe it's staying in that. Uh, uh, I'm concerned, uh, you know, as Karen mentioned, the numbers are increasing. It's not crazy like some other states, but um, I'm concerned what's going to happen between now and uh, mid-August when the, the kids would start their learning again. So, Okay. I don't know if I had a personal decision, a personal preference, that would be probably my most favorite in terms of going back. But, uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for more of a, a, a collaboration and getting the feedback from the administration because I, I trust their judgment. Okay. Anybody Can else want to, yeah, go right ahead. Can I ask yeah. another question. I probably should yeah. have asked this when Brian was speaking, but do the teachers will, would the teachers have an option if they're not comfortable in not coming back and finding another way to, I just wonder how many teachers based on the number of people who, who gave public comment that would, you know, what, what happens if a teacher says, I just don't feel safe, then what? And, and where do we replace them? Or do they just take a leave of absence? Do we find something else for them to do? I, I just would, and maybe we don't have an answer for that right now, but I think that would inform. Karen, we're, we're having some of those conversations uh, behind the scenes with uh, representatives from the teachers. And so we probably couldn't comment on that uh, publicly tonight, uh, but it is something that uh, we have been talking about and we continue to talk about. Point of order question. Um, go, go ahead, Don. It, it, just the way this works next week or when we get together again for our, uh, where we're actually going to vote on this, will the administration present us with what they believe to be the best scenario and then we will vote on that motion is that how that goes down uh yes generally that's how we've worked with you we believe our obligation is is to give you a recommendation and then you have the opportunity to motion it second it talk about it uh vote for it vote you know in any place along the line if it doesn't get a motion uh, it dies. If it doesn't get a second, it dies. If it goes to vote uh, and it's voted down, um, you know, it dies. But we, we think it's our obligation and we'll do that collectively. You won't hear my opinion or John's opinion or Tom's. You'll hear uh, collective from us 
Um, Don, we haven't um, gotten to that point yet because we're still gathering information just like you are sure. uh, moving forward. But we think that's always our obligation working with and for you uh, to provide you with a recommendation and to let you react from there. Does yeah. that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yeah, and Don, what, all I'm trying to do is kind of flush out, you know, any, you know, real strong feelings on, on the part of any of the board members so we don't set the administration up to actually work hard and propose something that none of us would ever support kind of thing. Right, So and that's a good idea. Might as well just kind of set expectations up front, I think. Okay. Beyond that, I would agree. I mean, I think, I think one of the, one of the messages that comes out of tonight and it's been part of the discussions we've had all, all last week is there's still a lot of work to do here. Um, and, and, and the devil's going to be in the details, no matter which option we choose. And, and it's not going to be perfect when we start, no matter what it is, but hopefully we'll make it better and better and better as we go. Okay. Anybody else want to weigh in strongly? Casey? I'd like to, um, yep. In that vein, I just kind of want to say one more time. First of all, I want to say I appreciate all the work that's gone into this that goes without saying the amount of time and effort is tonight is just an example of the amount of hours that everyone's put into these decisions and the, the primary focus is health and safety. Um, but I still am concerned about delivering a complete education with three essentially independent learning days in the hybrid option and the um, all e-learning option. And, and maybe I'm just thinking about some of the kids that aren't quite as self-motivated, um, might struggle a little bit. I worry about leaving those kids behind and I, I haven't found anything yet that's really made me feel better about that. Um, and you know, I, I understand what Tom's saying about Google Docs, believe me, I work in it, my kids work in it. Um, but if you're having kids do Zoom meetings as groups, that sounds great. But with no adult supervision, I, I still have some issues about supervision and remote work learning groups. Um, so those are some things I, I have to think about. And, and maybe, maybe Rita and you guys can think about other ways to make me feel a little more comfortable with some of that. Okay, good comments. Anybody else? All right. Yeah, can um, I make a suggestion before yeah. we close up? Um, and I'll, I'll look at um, Kevin and Lisa as well. Uh, we've been going almost four hours here. Um, I'm not sure how productive we're gonna be yeah. uh, in debriefing uh, collective bargaining, how much time we're gonna use. I would just make a suggestion. Of course, it's up to all of you. I would make a suggestion. Uh, we've got another bargaining session coming up, perhaps several more. Uh, that uh, next week or later this week, we might be better positioned to give the board an update on collective bargaining. So I don't know, Kevin, Lisa, and Pat, you, of course, yeah. but it's it's pretty late and we, I'm not sure how productive we're gonna be. So I would, my own opinion is I'm not gonna be productive a whole lot longer. Um, I guess I'd look at the four people who are not involved and say, do you want the five or 10 minute uh, Real quick overview of what's going on there, or or should we wait? I it's, re it's really a question for the four that are not involved. Obviously, Kevin, Lee, and I know sure. where we're at and what we're talking about. Um, I, I will I will I will concur with Kevin and Prentice. I don't think I'm going to be real productive for another 45 minutes or an hour. But yeah, I'd I'd rather um, wait till I have the mental bandwidth to process what you're telling me, <laughs> and I'm not sure I have it at 10:15 at night. I'm going to be okay. honest. <laughs> but I but I would I would love to here uh prior to our meeting monday oh yeah I mean, of course. Uh, and it's going to be hard to get all of this in because we're going to be spending a lot of time just trying to get yeah. to monday um, well, okay again, well but, but, but let's let, 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 let's let's figure it out we'll figure out how to get it in because i think it's important that we our attention span is where it needs to be um as opposed to my goodness we've been going since six o'clock well, and there's a chance, as, as, as I said to you in earlier communication, just providing you information, of course, that uh, it may well be later next week. I mean, we we're kind of talking about Monday, but if you recall, I said it could be any day next week, depending on how bargaining goes, right? So uh, because bargaining is such an inherent part of this uh, process. So it may not be Monday, and we may have an opportunity to have a standalone meeting just to do that or um, we can create time before you know, the, the meeting um, to have some discussion about that. But I think over the next 
you know, three days, we've made some good progress, but we're certainly going to be further along, um, you know, I think in, in a day or two. So, yeah, I think, I think the real hope tonight actually was to run some stuff by everybody to just make sure that the, the negotiating team is not going down the wrong road either. Um, yeah. Uh, and that, uh, was Pat, kind of, that, was, just, that was kind of the drive to do it more uh, or drive to do it sooner rather than later. Jim, what were you going to say? Yeah, Pat, I, I was just going to say, I, I could certainly hang in for a little while longer, but I certainly trust you guys to, you know, that you're, I wouldn't second guess your the path okay. you're going down and I'd be okay waiting. Okay. So um, I'm comfortable waiting unless anybody wants to object. We'll just figure yeah. out what, but I think we will, uh, we'll try to get that in here. Certainly, we're going to get that in before we advance this too much further. You've heard our comments and concerns. I feel like you've listened to them and you take that going into your bargaining sessions and update yeah. us. Um, okay. All right. We'll go with that. I'm, I'm good with it. I, I, I agree. It's getting, it's getting kind of late. All right. Now, the good news is, and there are still, I'm going to just, um, there are still 111 participants in the meeting which means it's close to 100 people from the public still engaged. So I'd like to say thank you to all those people who have hung in there all night as well. Um, and I'm, I'm also going to say something that I, I know I won't regret. Um, so to any and all of those of you who are still online, uh, if you do have any feedback, um, feel free to send it in, much like you would have before the meeting. Um, I would say any feedback we do get, we will make sure we read uh, in public uh, at our next meeting, in the public meeting session. I think it's real important. The only thing I, I think that is a little frustrating about a meeting like tonight is we didn't get a lot of feedback, um, although we wouldn't necessarily have responded, been able to respond to it anyway. So again, I, I'm just encouraging anybody that has any comments or feedback, please send it in. Uh, that feedback would be very valuable to us, okay? To that and, again, point, uh, and, and again, I'm, gr I'm grateful that over 100 people or almost 100 people, I think at one point we were up to 172, uh, really logged in tonight and, and engaged with us. Don? Pat, there was a Q&A stream that was going. Um, yeah. Can we it, it respond to those questions? Uh, so I think Mary uh, has done a little bit of that. There were just two questions that are in the queue right now. There's two questions that were answered and five dismissed. So we'll, we'll take a look at those and certainly respond uh, wherever we can. No question about that. Sure. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. So we'll, def we'll definitely respond to any questions that came in. But again, if anybody else has any input, um, you know, now's your chance. Uh, we covered a lot of material today. We would certainly be uh, interested in what you have to say. All right. I don't want to let this virtual Zoom format get in the way of us getting feedback that people would like to express. All right. In fact, again, as I said at the beginning of the meeting, the reason, one of the reasons we're still on Zoom is we could not have reached out to 172 people tonight because um, we'd be limited to 50. So in a way, it, it actually worked out. All right. Is there anything else? Okay. If not, I guess, do we need a motion to adjourn? Yes. Okay. So is there a motion to adjourn? Yeah. Second. Okay, uh, roll, I guess we need a roll call now for, yep. for these. Uh, Batson. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Rudy. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Huber. Aye. Lundstedt. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Okay, motion carries. Thank you very, very much to everybody on the call tonight. Thanks, and everybody. everybody that's Thank you, everybody. Good night, all. Take care, guys. Good night, all.